Our data indicate that caloric restriction leads to a marked improvement in glucose metabolism and body fat composition, including liver fat content. And that when you take meat out, it did nothing else. There seems to be no additional beneficial impact of reduced red meat and increased fiber intake on improvement in cardiometabolic parameters. So this starts to really ask some major questions about these vegan trials. Um, is it the removal of red meat or is it the reduction in calories in some of the other RCTs that we'll see? And in this first study, is it possible that it's actually the removal of polyunsaturated fats? Because there are a lot of studies like this one, the second one that I just showed that say, hey, you can get improvements in glucose parameters and loss of visceral fat when you're still eating meat. Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What is up, you guys? What is up? Welcome to another edition of the Fundamental Health Podcast. Another week is here. We are another week closer to the launch of my book, The Carnivore Code, thecarnivorecodebook.com. August the 4th, 2020 is when the second edition comes out, and I am so excited. We should get the audiobook out for pre order in the next week or so. Ebook and print are now available for pre order. I cannot wait to share this with you guys. Thank you so much for your support. For everyone that pre-orders, I am offering a special private video on YouTube about how to do the carnivore diet, how to eat a carnivore diet, and I will do a private Q&A. Thank you so much for your pre-orders in my book. It really helps us move the needle, and I could not believe more deeply that this movement will change the world and bring a lot of us, our families, our children, back to the radical health that they deserve, thecarnivorecodebook.com. You guys, every once in a while, most weeks, I am super stoked about the podcast. This week is no exception. And sometimes I do a podcast and I think this one is a gem among gems. And John Venus is a gem among gems. This is a, a really sincere, compassionate, kind individual who is very well known in sort of the physique bodybuilding world as a vegan for five years. You all may know about the previous episodes I've done with Elise Parker and Tim Sheaf. Also, previous vegans who stopped their uh, vegan lifestyle due to health effects. And um, John is a similar story. Yet another uh, very well-known vegan who has begun eating meat again and is feeling better because of it. We break it down in this podcast. All of those people, Elise, Tim, and now John, have received massive backlash and criticism. And despite this, they really feel like they are doing the right thing by telling the world about the, the inclusion of animal foods, how important these are for a healthy human diet. So John and I break it down in this podcast. We talk about his story, what he was told, what he believed, the ethics around it. And then we do something really cool, which is get into some of the science that he was shown, uh, given by vegan physicians that supported that movement. And we talk about it from his perspective, my perspective, shortcomings and benefits of the vegan diet in these studies. We try to give a balanced perspective, talk about the shortcomings. And I think that as John and I reviewed these studies offline, we came to some very interesting conclusions that uh, we're excited to share with you. And it's not to say that these studies don't show that a vegan diet can be helpful, but is it the exclusion of meat or is it something else that's going on in these diets? And John and I get into that exact thing or things that are most effective for reversing diabetes, visceral fat loss. These are things you've heard me talk about before. Uh, we get into all of that in this podcast. So it's an amazing one. And as you'll see, John is just so well-spoken, so sincere, and so interested in cultivating an open dialogue between both sides of this issue so that we can really just understand as a human population, what are the foods that make us healthy and what are the foods that promote disease? And so he is doing amazing work. Please support him. Check him out, uh, johnvenus.com. Uh, YouTube and Instagram. We will post this video that accompanies this podcast on both of those stations, my channel, his channel, all that kind of good stuff. But check out his stuff and give him some love because 
he's doing good work. And I really believe he is speaking with his true and authentic voice. And I am so appreciative for this time I got to spend with him. So I think you really enjoyed this one. As always, uh, if you enjoy this podcast, please leave me a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. This will also be on YouTube as a video with all the studies. You can see the show notes to this video uh, podcast or podcast in your ears at carnivoremd.com front slash podcast. There will be a listing for the John Venus show and it'll have all the references for all the studies in this video. Thank you also to my sponsors. Thank you to NutriSense. These folks are amazing. You guys listened to the CGM episode, the continuous glucose monitor episode. I learned so much about my blood sugar, my response to carbohydrates uh, with a CGM, with a continuous glucose monitor from NutriSense. I actually believe in their message so much that I wanted to support them financially. I became an investor in this company and am so excited about how Continuous glucose monitors will change the face of medicine. My dad is going to do a continuous glucose monitor from NutriSense, and I'm so helpful that it will help him change behavior. I would seriously recommend investing in a CGM for two weeks or four weeks or three months. You will get so much information out of this. You will be amazed, and uh, I think you will learn a ton. And it can also help people in your life that are struggling with dietary change understand how the foods they are eating are affecting their blood sugar. Nutrisense.io is the spot. They are amazing. Let them know I sent you. And uh, I think you will really appreciate the data you get from this investment in your health. It will be a game changer, I promise. I also love the folks at White Oak Pastures, whiteoakpastures.com, 150 years. But for the last 20, they've been doing regenerative agriculture. I did a podcast last week with Anya Fernald from Belcampo. And I did a podcast with Rob Wolf and Diana Rogers all of that, and as John and I talk about in this podcast, the ethics of raising meat are around how we farm the soil, how we protect the grasslands, how we protect ecosystems. That is how we preserve this for future generations. That is so critically important and is a really, really big deal if you want your children and their children to have healthy food and have um, healthy ecosystems to play in in the future. White Oak are great people doing this, and they are producing some of the best meat I've ever had. You can use the code CARNIVOREMD at White Oak Pastures for 10% off your first order. They are doing regenerative, grass-fed, grass-finished meat, beef. Uh, they are doing lamb. They are doing pigs and chickens. And as you've been hearing me talk about, we are working to get low poofa pork and low poofa chicken at White Oak as well. They do amazing stuff right now. Uh, their pork does not get soy, but we are working on improving the chicken feed as well. But it is all they are doing real pasture raising of chicken, and we are going to get better feed into those chickens and make them even more superhero chickens in the future. So check out whiteoakpastures.com. White Oak Chella is October 9th to 11th in Bluffton, Georgia. I want to see you there. I'm going to be there. I believe my friend Ken Berry is going to be there. We are going to have a good time. We're going to be dancing, grilling meat. I'm going to be talking, giving everybody high fives and hugs. I'm going to be steak dancing. Come to White Oak Chella October 9th to 11th at White Oak Pastures. Call them up if you need information. Whiteoakpastures.com, Carnivore MD for a uh, discount when you start. And last week on Friday, I had an Anya Fernald on the podcast. You can use the code CarnivoreMD at belcampo.com for a 20% discount there. Uh, support the regenerative farms. This is the way of the future. All right, you guys, on to the podcast. Thank you again to John Venus for coming on. Listen after for what is going on with me. John Venus, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, my friend. It's great to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And as we said before the podcast, you're in Norway. We'll talk about your background and how you got to Norway, but um, it's, it's raining there and the internet connection may not be amazing, but we're going to do the best we can because the wonders of technology are allowing us to connect around the world and share this cool story. So for people that don't know who you are, let's just start with your story and, and kind of work from there. Um, I, I said a little bit in the introduction to this podcast, but Tell us about your journey with health and fitness uh, into veganism and then how you got to be where you are today. Yeah, so I'll try to condense down to, uh, you know, a short snippet. But um, I think the best place to start would be nine years ago when I met uh, my girlfriend, now my wife. And that's when I was first introduced to the fitness lifestyle and, um, you know, lifting weights and resistance training. So that's kind of where this whole journey started in terms of social media, working out and just doing whatever I can to have a strong and healthy looking physique. 
and paying attention to nutrition and stuff like that. So, um, you know, in the, in the beginning of my training phase, uh, I was just a regular gym goer, um, you know, just, uh, using a lot of bro science that you see online, you know, just chugging down the whey protein shakes and eating a ton of chicken and, and, uh, all kinds of, uh, meats and just the regular stuff, rice, uh, you know, broccoli. Um, and I saw amazing, uh, results. Um, and it, within the first, I'd say 12 to 24 months, I saw the most amount of gains and muscle uh, progression. And I think that is very common. And uh, we have this term called, um, you know, newbie gains that we use in bodybuilding um, to kind of illustrate how quickly someone can gain muscle mass in the first two or three years of lifting. And it's absolutely insane. And because of the quick progression, I felt really motivated uh, to continue on this path and actually start sharing my journey online. Um, so that's when I started sharing and opening my social media pages to share fitness tips, what I was doing to gain muscle quickly and these things and what I was eating to gain muscle and how exactly my training went. Um, so I started that, I think, back in 2012, uh, I believe, and started taking it more seriously in 2013, somewhere around there. And I started on Instagram and YouTube and everything just progressed from there, uh, where I got introduced to veganism and the vegan lifestyle was, I'd say, eight years ago um, when my brother came back home one day and said that he was no longer going to eat meat and, uh, you know, partake in our uh, festivities in terms of food, like, you know, eating our traditional Christmas dinners and that kind of stuff because he was now a vegan. And I never heard the term ever in my life. Uh, veganism was completely uh, foreign to me, 100%. Never heard of anyone being vegan. I've heard about vegetarianism, but veganism was completely new. So I was completely shocked. Uh, I took it as a huge rejection um, on behalf of my family and me as a brother as well. I gave him a really big um, or a really hard time, made fun of him, said he was going to lose all his muscle, become weak and fracture his bones. Um, and funnily enough, he actually did, uh, you know, degress and uh, kind of he got weaker and, and uh, you know, he didn't really progress that much in the beginning because he wasn't, he didn't really know what he was doing and how to optimize his plant-based diet. Uh, but after that, he, you know, he adjusted and, and was able to progress. Um, so he tried to convince, uh, you know, me and, and showed some documentaries uh, like Forks Over Knives in particular. And at the time, I, I couldn't give a crap uh, about, um, you know, uh, health and, and longevity because I was like, you know, I was 22 or something like that. So I, I really didn't care. Um, and I didn't, I wasn't convinced by forks over knives or anything like that. I thought it was, you know, it's fine. It's probably healthy for some people, whatever, but it's definitely not for bodybuilding. So I carried on doing my thing. Um, by that time I built up a, you know, uh, decent following online, uh, for fitness. And a couple of years later, I, and my, my girlfriend at the time decided to watch a movie called earthlings, which kind of shows the behind the scenes of factory farming, uh, the pet industry, uh, the circus industry, that kind of stuff, and how animals are used to our advantage and benefit. And that was the day where me and my girlfriend just, you know, from one day to the next, just turned vegan straight away. I actually had to have one more pint of Ben and Jerry's cookie dough ice cream before that happened. But, um, you know, that was the last kind of step. Um, and that's kind of when I started sharing that perspective, that new journey that I was on uh, to my existing following base. And some people didn't like it, um, but it did attract uh, more people because it was really interesting. And uh, no one was really doing that uh, when I started. No one was really sharing uh, a health and fitness uh, kind of journey and lifestyle online that I was aware of, uh, or at least in the way that I was doing it. Um, and I didn't really see any examples out there. So I was kind of jumping into unknown waters. I didn't consider my brother to be a bodybuilder. So I was kind of prepared to lose all my muscle mass and progress. Um, but uh, yeah, it didn't happen, which was so you know surprising to me because I was you know overeating so much in calories. I was able to um, you know progress, keep going in the gym. Uh, I experience um, benefits in digestion because I struggle with constipation uh, my whole you know life almost. And yeah, things just you know got better. Um, I was able to progress. Um, st stuck with the vegan diet for five years. 
uh, was able to make you know progress and muscle mass uh, gains from that as well by you know doing it right and really being diligent with uh, my protein intake, uh, things like leucine and, and just getting the, the stuff down right. And I shared my journey throughout the whole whole time I was vegan and gave speeches around the world talking about you know nutrition and health um, and was kind of representing uh, you know uh, veganism and, and being a fit vegan. Um, for a long time. That's kind of what I became known for until, you know, this whole thing happened and, and uh, I moved away from the vegan lifestyle. And I think that that's, that story is laudable. I think that so many listening to this podcast have heard my other podcasts about regenerative agriculture and understand that animals are being mistreated. And it's totally a reasonable um, uh, motivation or a, a really, that's an informed choice. And I've always said that I think that the, the most important thing for humans on this planet is to make an intentional choice with regard to their diet, whether that's plant-based or carnivore or paleo. It's awesome that you made this intentional choice. I guess it was now five or six years ago. And that was based on some, uh, some truth within the factory farming industry about the way that animals are being mistreated. Yeah. I think you probably would agree that a lot of those movies are they're they're a little bit propaganda based and they're meant to elicit emotion and and really highlight the mistreatment of these animals which we can't deny is going on but as i've heard you say on other podcasts as we can get into at the end of this podcast there are certainly other ways that animals can be raised that are never really talked about in these circles as like hey this is the better way to do it it's it seems to me that these a lot of these plant-based movies or a lot of this kind of ideology or these these sort of um, these documentaries are are meant to make people very emotional uh, without really giving both sides of the story. Would you agree with that? Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, um, I you know last week I actually visited a dairy farm here in Norway just to you know hang out and, and see what was going on and and I was like it, it's a complete different scenario to what you see in in movies like that right and, and it's not to say that these factory farms and and intensive and um suboptimal conditions don't exist like you're saying they do of course but it, it doesn't apply to all animal uh food production systems and it depends a lot even within a single country you can have a you know, completely different system in one city and a completely different uh, opposing system in another city. So it's really hard to uh, generalize, just like it's really hard to generalize things in all aspects of life, right? It's it's not black and white. It's not all it's not all bad or all good. It's there's always a gray area and a middle ground and uh, nuances to every conversation. And ways to support more intentional agriculture versus less intentional clustered animal feeding operations. Just in the last week, I've had Rob Wolf and Diana Rogers on the podcast. They wrote a book here in the U.S. called Sacred Cow. There's a movie coming out. It's about regenerative agriculture. Everyone that listens to this podcast knows about White Oak Pastures now, which is a, a sixth generation farm that's been doing regenerative agriculture for 20 years now. And they treat their animals so well. It looks nothing like these CAFOs. And, and then last week on yeah. Friday, I had Anya, Anya Fernwald on the podcast, who's the CEO of El Campo. They have a 30,000 acre farm that's doing it the right way. So there are ways to do this. But I think that, you know, when people are worried about these clustered animal feeding operations and, and factory farming, it's important to say to them, hey, there's other ways to do it. Do you choose to not eat animals or do you choose to support the ways that are perhaps more humane to the animals and can still provide good food? We'll get into that. The other aspect of your story that I think is so interesting is that you, you did achieve an incredible physique on a plant-based diet. I'll show some photos here. You can corroborate that these are actually you. <laughs> this is fun, <laughs> Venus. Yeah. And, and you know, this, so this is, this is a photo when you were vegan, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. And is this, um, <clears throat> is this you and your, your wife now, that then girlfriend and then to this? Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty interesting to, to see this and to note that it is possible, I believe, as you say, with a careful attention to these muscle building amino acids, specifically leucine, to turn on muscle protein synthesis, to turn on mTOR on a vegan diet to actually gain muscle. Now, I've heard you talk about this a little bit on some podcasts. Does this mean that you were doing a lot of, were you doing specific leucine supplementation? I've heard you say you were doing pea protein. What were you doing as a plant-based bodybuilder to get a physique like this? 
Mm -hmm. Great question. And it's been something that I've educated people on for the last five years and been coaching people uh, to be able to do right. And like you say, uh, it does require a lot of planning and uh, diligence. And for me, I always said on my social media that it's not that complicated um, to be a vegan, but it is a little bit more complicated to be a vegan bodybuilder. And to be honest, when you get in the routine of anything, it becomes simple to you, right? Because you, you're you know, used to your routines, you're used to picking and choosing the foods that will allow you to progress in a certain way. So for me, it was never a, a big challenge. I never tracked my macros or calories apart from when I was getting ready for photo shoots. Um, but the main thing that people often make the mistake of doing when they're not vegan is assuming that you know, the only way to get enough leucine and amino acids is through protein powders. Um, and the rest is just, you know, rice and beans, right? So um, the way that I have always done it and the way that I've taught other people to do, and a lot of people have had success with is choosing the foods that have the highest amino acid scores and are highest in leucine, right? So specifically soy, um, you know, tofu and tempeh are, you know, my staples for protein. Of course, I eat lentils and beans and all kinds of stuff as well. Um, but I did focus very heavily on tempeh specifically because it's fermented. It's a little bit better for your gut, et cetera. Um, and then tofu and these things never really, you know, promoted the, the, the beyond, uh, meat burgers and that kind of stuff. They're fine for convenience and, and to have fun, but definitely not a health food. Um, I've always promoted a whole foods diet, um, and tempeh and tofu, they're slightly processed, but they're still kind of considered whole food ish. So the, those are kind of the, the main staples for people who want to up their protein intake, um, to a certain level. Now I will admit that it was really challenging to, even with eating a lot of tempeh and tofu, it's challenging to get to, you know, one gram per pound of body weight. It's really challenging to do that. Um, however, there are studies out there suggesting that perhaps you don't need that much. And it depends on many different factors like recovery, sleep, et cetera. So who knows what the golden number is exactly. Some studies show that, you know, even 1.4 or 1.2 grams per pound is, is way better for athletes. So it, it really is still a question mark in the fitness uh, scientific community, what the optimal number is. And it probably varies greatly from individuals um, out there. Um, but it is hard to get to that, you know, really high numbers, which becomes problematic when you're going to cut down for bodybuilding shows or when you have to do a photo shoot and keep your amino acid intake higher so that you're, you don't go into a catabolic or at least minimize the catabolic, um, aspects of, uh, being on a caloric deficit, right? So that is the, the area where it's more challenging than an omnivorous diet for sure is the losing body fat while maintaining your muscle mass. Yeah, it is interesting. And <clears throat> for anyone that's interested in this in more detail, I did a previous podcast with my friend Brian Sanders, where we broke down the James Wilkes and Chris Kresser podcast on Joe Rogan. In that, there's something on my website, Carnivore MD. If you guys want to find this, there's a whole huge set of show notes there. We talk about the DIAS score, the digestible and dispensable amino acid score. From everything that I've read and talked to other researchers in terms of muscle protein synthesis, there's kind of this switch with leucine. And if you get enough leucine, 2.6 grams in a meal, something like that, you can turn on mTOR. You can get muscle protein synthesis. And so like John is saying, if you focus on the plant-based foods that are highest in leucine, you're going to have to do this very intentionally. It is possible to do this. At what cost? We can get into this later in the podcast. And does that forsake other important animal-based nutrients? Probably. Does it potentially lead to GI problems? Potentially, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's all of this kind of you know, discussion around is, is monocrop soy the best thing to be eating in general? If we're talking about the environment and biodiversity, is that the right choice either? But all of that aside, I, I agree with you. And I think you're a good example of the fact that if you are very intentional about a plant-based diet, it is possible to build muscle at what cost we'll get into it later in the podcast. Because as listeners will know, at this point, you've decided to start adding meat back into your diet, which is an incredibly, um, I think, uh, brave move to be such a prominent vegan and to say, hey, I'm going to add it back. We'll get into all that soon too. But it's an interesting point. And I want to, the contrast I want to draw here is between your physique and the physique of two well-known vegan doctors. So Michael Greger <laughs> doesn't quite look like John Venus. And um, that's interesting. Not getting the temp in. No. What's that? <laughs> Is not getting the tempe and I see. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, neither does Neil Barnard. 
So these are two of the prominent vegan physicians. Later in this podcast, we'll look at some studies by Neil Barnard, but um, these, these physicians do not look like you. And so I think it's just important to point out that um, unless you are really thinking about where you're getting your protein from on a plant-based diet, you may end up looking more like Michael Greger, which I don't think anybody wants to look like this. And this doesn't really look healthy to me. We'll talk about it more in the podcast later on. But, um, crazy stuff. Now, so you, you were not a vegan growing up. Your family ate meat. Your brother comes home and says, hey, I want to be a vegan. You see this documentary. You make this totally reasonable choice to, to be considerate of animals on this planet. You, you have great success building a body as a vegan bodybuilder. What happened next? Because it seems like things were going really well. And then why did you stop or what, what prompted it? And tell us the next chapter of the story. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think it's important also to just state that I didn't personally suffer from any, you know, serious health issues or anything like that. However, when I was coaching people, I could clearly see, especially when I started, you know, doing more in-depth coaching, I started to see some kind of pitfalls and some potential, um, you know, areas to be a little bit more concerned about when you are 100% vegan, especially with people that have existing gut issues and, um, you know, some other kind of autoimmune conditions that make it really hard for them to digest uh, fiber and certain, um, um, you know, plant nutrients and, um, you know, absorb the nutrients that they need to be optimally healthy, right? So, um, in the last five years, I have felt that, you know, everything was good with myself. Um, my wife was feeling good. Um, I also, you know, coach a lot of people to great shape, even though 95% of people who bought my custom meal plans and were not part of the actual intensive coaching program because they were, because of the lack of accountability, people just fall off. So, you know, and a vegan diet in itself is hard to follow for someone who's used to eating meat. So that also kind of makes the dropout rate higher. Um, but I also believe in anecdotes, how you feel in your body. And I was feeling pretty good. Apart from the time when I got injured on my back, I herniated my uh, you know L L four L five disc, and um, my life completely changed then because I was so used to you know lifting heavy weights, uh, playing soccer, running around, hiking all the time, and I just couldn't do any of it. It was completely um, ruining everything, and that put me in a really kind of depressed state um, that I've never been in before in my entire life, and I kind of you know, started spending a lot more time, you know, in front of the computer, uh, you know, researching different things, different problems, issues with my back, what could potentially heal and make the healing process faster. And I couldn't really find that much. I mean, like, you know, if you Google, you know, how to fix hernia discs, it's yoga poses and stretches and, and not much else. Um, some people recommend surgery, although that is kind of a last resort uh, scenario. And I didn't want to go down that route. Um, and then I started listening to other sides of the story because for the last five years, I was always of the opinion that a plant-based diet was not only, you know, the most ethical and potentially environmentally friendly diet, but also um, the healthiest, the, the most optimal diet for human health because I am in the health space. I'm in the, in the fitness and nutrition space. And this is what is being you know put out there by a lot of uh, vegan doctors um and just influencers in general they will make a strong case or seemingly strong case that the vegan diet is optimal and when you're a vegan yourself when you're ethical vegan and you've already decided on how to live your life and you know for the rest of your life you kind of you know you, you get satisfied with you know a, a small amount of information with a small amount of you know quote unquote proof and you just, you know, take those studies and those, uh, those pieces of evidence as truth or at least very strong evidence. And you just move on with your life because of that moral ethical code that you have. Um, so, you know, we just felt, you know, pretty good up until the injury. And when I got the injury, I started researching the other side, which, you know, when you're a vegan, the other side means anything other than veganism, right? So there is no middle ground. There is no unbiased. It's either veganism or you know, murder and um, just bad science, <laughs> essentially. 
So when I removed that kind of thought and just, you know, accepted the fact that, you know, we as, as people and men and science, especially in, in the nutrition space has really not come that far. Um, and a lot of times we overcomplicate things and, and we draw conclusions way too soon. And I just started listening to all kinds of camps. So, you know, I listened to a lot of people who were more of the paleo preference uh, doctors that were more, um, you know, keto, um, even carnivore like yourself. Um, and I started, you know, getting a lot more information that kind of went against what I always believed, which was the plant-based diet being the most optimal um, and, you know, the, the, the best for human health, um, even though, you know, somehow <laughs> supplements and, and that kind of stuff just went above my head. I just like kind of accepted it as a, as a kind of must have because of the modern uh, world that we, we now have the sanitized world. This is what you hear all the time in the vegan community is that we live in such a sanitized and cleansed world that, you know, we're not getting the B12 from drinking water from the water streams anymore. And, uh, you know, you used to be able to get it from eating dirty vegetables and these things, even though, you know, even, even animals and, and monkeys are able to wash their vegetables. So I'm not sure how, how that kind of worked. I don't think people were eating dirt uh, before either. So it, once I realized that I looked into the studies, I realized that for sure B12 is missing and there, there is no, no evidence that there was ever a time that, that humans were getting <laughs> their water or their B12 from water streams, right? And, um, you know, in Game Changers, they actually make this point and they reference a study, which, you know, we can get into later, but it turned out that it wasn't a great study to represent this, this belief, right? So, um, and then, you know, I just kind of uh, kept researching and mixed with, you know, my, my slow recovery from my back and mixed with the people that I was coaching, uh, that I was coaching and the people that I was in touch with in real life who are really struggling, who have been vegan for, you know, over a decade, uh, who are now reconsidering things because of, you know, different health conditions, uh, seeing that they can't digest anything and absorb anything other than animal products and how hard uh, they had to fight this belief system themselves. I kind of came to the realization that maybe this diet is not too optimal and definitely not healthy for everyone. You know, before I thought there was always a vegan solution to absolutely everything. Now I absolutely don't think that that is the case. Um, and the reason for that can be discussed and, and, and debated, but there is definitely a lot of people that just cannot make a vegan diet work. And that is a new belief that has only been, you know, in my life for the last two years or so. And I think that this is, you bring up so many interesting points there. I want to, the, the point about, so I want to share with people who are watching on YouTube a couple of things. So this is a, uh, a breakdown of the Wilkes and Cresser debate that's on my website, Carnivore MD. And, and in, this, um, in this breakdown, which has links to all the studies that I talked about, which is a podcast that I've previous done, previously done, we talk about this, uh, this study that James Wilkes was using to say that you could get B12 from water. And we actually did the calculations and they're pretty comical. <laughs> like you would have to drink between three and 20 liters of this water when there are the most nucleria or uh, it's not nucleria. There's another, maybe it is nucleria. There's a, uh, there's a sort of a, a protozoa that lives in the water that can give you some B12 if you're drinking uh, euglena, sorry, euglena gracilis uh, in the English Lake District. And, and if you look at the amount of euglena in this water at different times of the year, it's only when it's the highest you could ever get anything approaching uh, a biologically relevant amount of B12. And the rest of the year, you would have to drink 20 to 40 liters of this water. And this is only at one lake in, in England. And it's like, this is the most... This is the most shoddy, you know, sketchy <laughs> science I've ever seen saying that vegans could ever get, that you could ever get B12 from this water source. The other thing that he was saying about the soil you can find from this study in 1988 from Herbert, uh, B12 sources in, in plants and food, if you really look at it, what you'll find is that the only way that people were getting B12 by eating vegetables that were unwashed was when those vegetables were grown in what's called night soil, which is human manure. So people figured out that if they could not get animals, if they grew the vegetables in human poop, which incidentally makes fertile soil, you can get B12 from eating your own poop. And sometimes gorillas do this potentially for that reason, but there's no real bioactive B12 in soil that's not human poop. So these arguments are just a little bit crazy to think about and, and for any yeah. vegan to say that. And it, it is interesting that you noticed 
that, that this is a real problem, that, you know, there's really, there are some major nutritional deficiencies on a vegan diet, not to mention things like creatine, carnitine, choline, carnosine, answerine, taurine, vitamin K2, in addition to B12, all things I talk about in my book, The Carnivore Code. Now, the other thing I want to mention is, I think that when you had such success with this, uh, to me, it looks like the, the vegan community just held you up as this champion, understandably so, but it, it, a lot of the stories weren't totally true, were they? I mean, I found this story on the Daily Star. Have you seen this one? And, and the headline was, this man got ripped after making one simple diet swap. They do call you a ridiculously shredded social media star, which you know, <laughs> like, it's a high praise. But the, the, basically in the article, they're trying to say that you cut out meat and did this, which isn't really the case, is it? No, 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 definitely not. Definitely not. I mean, there, there are tons of articles like this. And yeah, uh, that picture was like uh, so old. You know, the, the before picture uh, that you just showed is, is from when I was like 17. I didn't, didn't even touch weights uh, at that point. So that was kind of like, you know, me not even, you know, just eating my regular diet that my parents fed me and just, you know, doing, you know, regular high school studies and homework and these things, not no training whatsoever. So definitely not the case. Uh, there's definitely a lot of, um, you know, training techniques and uh, the, the principle of progressive overload and just making sure that you're always progressing in the gym and recovering well and sleeping and all these things that play you know, uh, probably a, a very, very big part of uh, the progress that I made. Nutrition, of course, is a huge part of it, but without the training, without the the intention of, uh, you know, progressively overloading your muscles over time, then you're not going to get, uh, you know, any results like that at all. In the first few years of your bodybuilding career, you were eating animal foods, right? As, if I understand the history. Yeah. And then you yeah, first to, three years, yeah. And it, it, is, it is quite interesting and remarkable that you didn't lose those gains and continue to progress on a vegan diet. But I just think it's interesting that not all of them are doing this, but there is some of this kind of, let's just admit it, it's propaganda in the vegan plant-based movement to say, look at John Venus, he's ripped. All he had to do was cut out meat and he got ripped. It's like, wait a minute, that's not yeah. a real story. And here's John Venus right. telling you that it's not totally true, right? It's crazy. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, this, this is a point that, you know, the, the, it's a, it's a good selling point for, for vegans. Right. And, and I did make progress, but it was nowhere near the progress that I made in the initial three years of eating animal products. Right. And that is normal because the first three years are the years that you're going to gain the most anyway. But yeah, I, I always try to make sure that people understood that, that this was, this is a slow process and you know, the vegan diet doesn't necessarily make it speed up at all. Um, if anything, it's the same. And uh, as long as you, you know, you account for those different factors and make sure that you get enough protein, et cetera. Um, but yeah, like uh, there's a lot of misleading articles um, about me when I was a vegan, about me now after not being vegan anymore. And it, it just never ends. Like you can't control it. Right. So it's a machine. It's, it's pretty crazy. So, yeah. so you were looking at, you were seeing these clients and you were seeing that some clients had issues and that really did better with meat, which has got to be interesting as you're a vegan. And then you said you had the, this herniated disc, um, which wasn't healing very well. Um, and then you also had muscle cramps as a vegan that were pretty bad, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, horrendous. Uh, that was, you know, probably the more like the most serious um, health issue. Like I, I don't know if you consider the health issue, but like it was oh, a, it was a very yeah, it's a it was a very very intense experience and really affected um you know my quality of life as at least you know um, for five you know hours after training uh, which is pretty much every day, um and some days were better than others. Some days I didn't really get a cramp, but I was when I was really trying to kill it in the gym and and really go hard and and get the volume that I really needed to, you know, bring those muscles back that I lost after being inactive because of the herniated disc, um, I would cramp up like crazy. And, and I was filming a stretching routine video once, and I, I think the memory card is in Spain, but uh, I have a video of me trying to film this, you know, cobra pose, and I was extending my triceps, and when I, when I extended them, both of my arms, both of my triceps, cramped up at the same time and it was the most excruciating pain i've ever felt um you know even worse than breaking my arm it was crazy and it was constant it wasn't there was nothing i could do to you know make it go i was just lying, laying there uh for seven minutes i believe and just like breathing 
so seven there's, minutes. There's this, huge, there's this huge clip of me just like looking at the at, at the sky, just like breathing and like, you know, it looks like I was praying or something. So it was really intense. And, and that was, you know, something that I, I've always tried to fix by trying to get enough electrolytes in, into my system, enough zinc, magnesium, these things. Um, and I even tried supplementing with, uh, you know, additional zinc and magnesium and electrolytes, but nothing seemed to be working and getting rid of the cramps. Um, but yeah, that is now a lot better after introducing some animal products. Why is, you know, I can't know because again, I tried everything that I thought was reasonable um, as a vegan and, you know, supplementation is supposed to work. But um, there's something else that was going on that made it um, a lot better after introducing and reincorporating animal products. And I think this kind of gets to my main concern with vegan diets. Listeners of this podcast will know that I've had Robbie and Cyrus on from Mastering Diabetes and had kind of a friendly debate with them. And look, I think that if someone is eating a standard American diet full of processed foods and you go to a plant-based diet, which has no processed foods, you're going to be making an improvement in your diet. And you and I are going to review some, some randomized controlled trials of vegan diets, kind of break down why that might be the case. Uh, but I do have concerns long-term about exclusively plant-based diets because of these nutrient deficiencies, leading to things like potentially worsening or exacerbation, longer healing times for a herniated disc, potentially related to inadequate glycine or inadequate collagen or other nutrients that are needed for collagen repair. And these cramps are really undeniable. We know that zinc is really the most efficient nutrient, at least that I've seen in the medical literature with the vegan diet. And I, I do think that it's possible to do a plant-based diet long-term, but like you're suggesting, you, you have to just supplement with so many things that you, you kind of got to scratch your head and go, is this really the way to do it? Why am I excluding meat in the first place? And again, that's why I think it's so cool that you and I get to break down some of these studies that plant-based advocates use to say you shouldn't eat meat from a health perspective, because a lot of that is really based on some pretty shoddy science, in fact. Yeah. So it just, it starts to work so much more you know, efficiently and smoothly when you have animal foods in your diet. It's great to hear that your cramps are so much better. And I have to add to that my own anecdotes and the anecdotes of people I've seen on the carnivore side, which is that for some people who do low carbohydrate diets long-term, they also get really bad cramping. And this is not to say it's exclusive to a plant-based diet. They also get really bad cramping and they can get palpitations that are pretty severe. And so many listeners to this podcast that follow my story will know that you know, I've been carnivore now for two years. And for the first year and a half, I had no added carbohydrates. Uh, it was just all animal products. And I felt pretty darn good overall. My gym performance was good, but I did get cramping as well. I don't think it was as bad as your seven minutes, you know, staring at the sky <laughs> cramping. But I had a similar experience where I would try lots of salt. Uh, I tried magnesium. I tried potassium. Uh, I had some days where I had so much potassium that my mouth got numb and I thought this is a bad idea, you know, <laughs> and, and then I tried no salt because I was thinking, you know, maybe humans aren't meant to get this much salt. And when I went, when I went no sodium, I had the worst cramping of my life. I would tense my arm over my head as I was typing the book. So this is a year ago, essentially I'm sitting at my computer typing my book, you know, the carnivore code, and I, I could get my forearm to cramp just by flexing my forearm, my right. forearm would cramp. And I thought, this is crazy. Like I need to have sodium in my diet. So eliminating sodium made my muscle cramps and the tonicity of it way, way worse. And ultimately this was one of the real um, motivations for me to wear a continuous glucose monitor from NutriSense and to reincorporate carbohydrates in my diet. Um, and, and I started with honey, which I would think of as sort of a plant-based, not plant-based, who knows if it's honey or not. <laughs> or not. It's all dogmatic at this point, but I yeah. include honey in my diet immediately felt better from an electrolyte perspective because we fear insulin so much in, in, in the low carb community, which I do believe is valuable and I'm a part of. And I think that that's, that's too myopic of us. So in some ways, you know, I haven't received a lot of negative backlash, backlash, but I have gotten some, and I want at the end of this podcast, we'll talk about what you've experienced, but by choosing to incorporate some carbohydrates in my diet, it's so funny how there are dogmatic people on both sides of the equation. Mm -hmm. And there are people looking at me and going, you wrote a book about carnivore and now you're telling me to include carbohydrates. And, I'm, and I just say to them like, hey, there's nuance here. And if you want to include carbohydrates, it's probably going to allow you to maintain your electrolytes better. But how interesting how, how in some ways parallel these stories are. And for me, I don't get cramps anymore and I don't get palpitations anymore. And as I showed in the continuous glucose monitor episode, I'm also not insulin resistant getting carbohydrates. 
So that's yeah. a podcast for another day. But but I do think that it's it's important to admit or to 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 really share my side of the story too that. I think that extreme elimination diets on either side of the equation can be damaging and, and we shouldn't be dogmatic on either side. And right now I eat what I consider to be an animal-based diet because it's all animal foods and honey. Um, I personally didn't like the way fruit and fiber made me feel in my stomach, but, but in my book, in the carnivore code, I have a tier one diet, which is includes some of the, what I consider to be the least toxic plant foods. So I've had my battles with cramps as well. And if people are listening to this, realize that 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 it doesn't have to be all black or all white so that's really yeah i i think honey you know for vegans honey mo for most vegans it's not you know honey is not vegan so it, it would actually be considered carnivore still right you know, that's some, the... to some people <laughs> so but it's yeah like you're saying this is one of my biggest battles and and a battle that i've been fighting as a vegan as well because i never wanted to be promoting this uh dogmatic way of thinking this very judgmental and uh, you know, cult-like mentality where you know you're either you know part of this kind of group and or this one, and you kind of hate each other, and you try to you know demonize each other and undermine each other and and bash each other's opinions constantly. I don't think that is a healthy human behavior. It, it's very damaging for psychology and for mental health, in my opinion. And of course, you know, these negative outlooks and these, you know, conflicts and, and human conflicts definitely play a role in our general well-being as well. Mental health is a huge aspect of health and a very underlooked one, um, especially by a lot of people in the nutrition and fitness uh, space. So I always try to kind of remind people that it's not about, you know, black or white. It's not about, you know, doing this 100% correctly or this. It's about trying to do whatever you know you feel works and having an open discussion between people with opposing views and allowing you know free communication to pass through all kind of um, you know communication lines openly, freely, without censorship, without anything like that, and just getting to the bottom or at least you know having those healthy discussions without triggering each other and and calling each other names and that kind of stuff. So I really want to you know do my best to kind of eliminate this dogmatic view, but unfortunately humans tend to, um, you know, uh, get drawn to these extreme way of, uh, ways of thinking. And especially, I'd say, like, in the, in the vegan community and also a lot of, you know, doctors and, and health professionals are also very much, you know, black and white and have some extreme views as well, uh, in my opinion. So I don't know if you see that as well. I do. And I think we all, we're all susceptible to it. And I've had to fight it in yeah. my own mind, in my own life. And um, and, and I believe me in my community, there's backlash too. If you say keto isn't the end all and be all, then I have yeah. good friends who might be offended. Like, what do you mean? You know, I, when I, I mean, you know, in my, in my, I think one of the most interesting things for me in my work as a physician has been to understand what is really the root cause of this chronic illness. And, and the more I look at it, I'm just not convinced it's carbohydrates. I'm not saying that humans should eat processed sugar, but I think there are other culprits like polyunsaturated vegetable oils and a lot of the studies we're going to review today might point to that as well. And I think that it's important for humans to know what is causing human illness and disease so that we can make an informed choice and, and not to be dogmatic, to step outside of that. But I love what you're saying there, that in the debates that I've done, I don't know how productive they are because I'm never going to convince a vegan physician to be carnivore and they're probably not going to convince me to go the other way. And when they go up online, people who are just already have already chosen a team just support their team player. It's like a match yeah. between the Dodgers and whatever, you know, and, and, and the Red Sox or whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. Like people have their allegiances. They show up to these matches wearing a ball cap. that says vegan yeah. or carnivore or keto. And, and they're just there to root for the home team and, and hope that that guy can get in a good shot, like a good, a good punch on the other guy. And so it, it really is more device than anything else. And when I can encounter, a plant-based doctor or an omnivorous doctor um, who, who's willing to have these open conversations, that's much more productive for me. Every once in a while, there are these vegan physicians who want to debate me, and I'm, I'm well, happy to do it, but I'm just not sure how productive it is, especially when those vegan physicians are usually calling me names, which I do my best not to reciprocate. But you and I both know these guys. We don't have to mention their names now, but there's a lot of vegan physicians out there who just want to denigrate me and now they want to denigrate you too and it's just don't think, like it's not about that you guys it's just about understanding how humans can be healthy and i think that as we'll get into these studies in a moment there is a lot of valuable information in in randomized controlled trials using vegan diets they can tell us a whole lot about human health and we shouldn't ignore that 
just like we shouldn't ignore the other randomized controlled trials that show that red meat is not inflammatory, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a body of evidence. And stories like yours, I think, are very valuable, just like stories on the carnivore side. You had said earlier in this podcast that when you cut out all animal products in your diet, you did have some health improvements in your constipation. And that's a valuable data point. And I've never wanted to ignore that, even as someone who who feels like a, an animal-based diet is potentially going to be better for humans long-term. To me, those sorts of stories are interesting. And I look at them and say, what is, about, what, what is it about what John did that, that improved his constipation? Was it cutting out meat? The devil's in the details, right? Was it cutting out meat? Was it cutting out dairy? Was it cutting out something else? Let's try and understand it because uh, that's an important thing for us to be able to really glean and then share with other people. So um, let's, let's move into these studies in a moment. But before we do that, tell us what you're doing now and, and how you're feeling now that you've incorporated meat back in your diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right now I'm, because I've been vegan for so long for ethical reasons, um, you know, I, I can't just go back to buying factory farm meat or, or these mass produced meats. And then I try, you know, not to buy anything from the grocery store, uh, in terms of animal products and also, you know, trying to grow as much of the plant food, uh, as we can, uh, in our own garden as well, just to, you know, be as environmentally friendly as possible, um, et cetera. And just to, you know, be able to live <laughs> with myself essentially after being vegan for so long. And, you know, everything changed once I got rid of that, you know, needless killing, right? It, it's when I realized that it wasn't needless, when I realized there is a lot of merit to, you know, incorporating animal foods into your diet for many different reasons, you know, uh, it, it's not black and white anymore. And therefore I was a hundred percent okay with eating meat and animal products and, you know, just going for it and doing whatever is best for my health, for my family's health, uh, for my son's health. And, you know, now I'm trying to source my meat as well as I can. I'm using my current uh, privileged position of being in a place where we're surrounded by so much deer uh, in, in this village that we are in, in Norway and they have to be controlled and you know we are living with a family of hunters and as you can probably tell by the do you want to show the, the rest of the room do we dare <laughs> i mean since we're on the topic you know it's quite a few here um so you know i am in a very privileged position where i can source my meat in a fantastic way um these deer are living you know in their natural habitat they're uh eating um, you know, their uh, species specific diets, they're not being, you know, fed <laughs> polyunsaturated fatty acids and, and all these grains and soybeans. So it's the, in my opinion, it's probably one of the best meats that you can get out there for, for health. And, and it really does, um, you know, it doesn't feel misaligned with my moral code at all. Um, I also am fishing here, uh, in mountain lakes and also in the river. Um, they actually had to close on the river because of a parasite infection. Um, so they haven't been able to fish for salmon for, I'd say six years, but they opened it up, uh, I think it was four days ago. And, uh, my wife's dad caught a, a salmon and like a, I don't know, like 12 or 14 pounds salmon, wow. uh, straight away, which was, you know, within 20 minutes of fishing, which was really, you know, crazy. So I'm able to source my animal products really well. And we also just had, a you know, set up a backyard uh, egg kind of uh, operation. So we got um, 11 chickens right now and um, they're not laying eggs yet, but they will be soon. So that'll be, you know, a, a good way to kind of, you know, get access to healthy pasture raised eggs and also um, use their manure to kind of uh, fertilize our, you know, uh, plant foods as well and berries and all these things. So I'm trying to do things in a, in a way that you know, promotes health, but also kind of shows people a little bit of a different way of doing things. And, and I still think it's important to be conscious of our food production system of, of factory farming of, you know, the abuse towards, uh, you know, animals and even, you know, uh, slaughterhouse workers and, and, you know, all kinds of issues around the world. I think it's really important. I'm never going to go away from talking about that. But it's also important to not be so black and white and, and just demonize one food and say it's unhealthy. And, and this is the thing that I've been seeing so much uh, after I've come out as, as no longer vegan. You get people and even doctors, nutritionists in particular, who are YouTubers saying that processed foods 
you know, they, they claim that I'm not vegan because I experienced health issues from eating processed vegan junk food, which, you know, I didn't really eat that much of, but they find clips and they make their stories up. Um, and they say that processed vegan junk food is almost as bad as animal products. I'm like, you know, how twisted do these people, you know, have to uh, kind of promote things? It's, it's really uh, counterproductive to just use your kind of belief system to completely you know, make up stories and make up, uh, you know, fake science and, and just promote um, this misleading idea that all animal foods are extremely bad for you, even worse than junk food. Um, it's just horrible. Which, of course, means that I can't eat a lot of it because I'm trying to stay stick with uh, the way that I'm sourcing my food right now. So doing a carnivore diet might be a little challenging for me uh, with the amount of, uh, you know, food that I have available. Uh, I am getting my hunting license. I'm going to be hunting my own food as well soon. So I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, I'd say my diet is still predominantly plant-based. I'd say 85%. Some days, like more animal products. Some days, a little bit less. Some days, I kind of exp like do almost a whole day with only animal products uh, just to see how I feel, you know, with whatever I have available. Um, and just experimenting at this point, just seeing how my body feels uh, on different ratios and I'm feeling good. I don't have anything to complain about. Um, I didn't feel any negative side effects. I only felt benefits from reincorporating animal foods. Um, so yeah, I, I'm pretty certain that, you know, for the majority of the population, including at least some, you know, even if it's just some mussels or an oysters and, and these small things that, you know, actually are extremely nutrient dense and have a lot of things that are missing from the plant kingdom could be a beneficial thing to consider. Yeah, that's amazing. And I'm, I'm excited to hear about this with your hunting. You'll have to let me know how it goes. Are you going to eat the organ meats? Because all the listeners of this podcast know that I'm a huge yes. fan of organs. <laughs> so I think that this is also an ethical way to eat yeah. animals, that if you're going to harvest an animal, as our ancestors did, we wouldn't have wasted the liver or the spleen or the heart. Have you eaten any of that? Do you plan to eat that stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so usually people don't um, you know, uh, preserve th those parts. People just go for the lean muscle meats and kind of ignore the organ meats. Uh, you know, uh, my wife's dad has uh, kind of kept organ meats in the past, but he doesn't have any, any right now, so I haven't been able to try them. But when I'm going to hunt my animals, I'm going to just <laughs> keep the whole thing, um, you know, just use the bones for bone broth if possible. Um, who knows, even even tongue, like <laughs> I might eat everything, every bit of it. So uh, we'll see how it goes. But um, yeah, I'm really excited to learn the whole, whole process, you know, because, you know, it's uh, this is what a lot of vegans don't understand and, and criticize me the most for is, is how can you go from someone who's an ethical vegan who you know, really cares for animals and thinks that animal suffering is unnecessary and, you know, you're compassionate and whatever. Yeah, I have, even have a tattoo of compassion on my wrist. Um, how can you go from that to killing your own animals, you know, cutting them open and just removing organs and, you know, eating its heart and tongues? But uh, it's just, you know, if you are going to eat animal uh, products for the sake of your health, uh, I think that that is something that I personally need to go through just you know spiritually or whatever like you know just because i've been preaching that way of life for so long of of compassion and and you know uh, no no killing of animals and these things i feel like i have to you know go through this process of actually harvesting the animals myself and learning everything and take responsibility of my own food supply rather than just you know buying some random It's like, did you pause there for a second? You said yeah, we're you, back. Yeah. You said you just not buying some random, random store-bought meat, presumably. Yeah. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Instead of just buying some random, you know, ground beef uh, from a factory farm at the grocery store. Yes. And you know, what is interesting, John, is I, I, I hope that anyone who doesn't want to kill animals or is an ethical vegan, I wish that these people could experience what it's like to hunt as you have uh, or, or will. It's such a spiritual experience to do this. And in the, in the times that I've hunted with a bow, which has been the, the two times that I've hunted and the two times that I've been able to, to harvest a deer, it's incredibly spiritual. <laughs> and it's just this very resounding reminder to be a good human, 
because I've been able to participate in this cycle of life. And it sounds very cheesy, but it's so true. And it's sacramental in a way that I could never have experienced going to the grocery store. And I'm not at a point where I can get all of my meat by hunting right now, but I, it's something that I want to do every year uh, and multiple times a year now. And it's going to be more and more part of my life because it's such a reminder that no matter what we're eating, we should be thankful for it, whether it's a plant or an animal. Like, yes. So I've, I've talked about this book in the past. If people are concerned about the ethics of eating meat, I would recommend the book, The Tracker by Tom Brown. There's a fantastic line in that book when Tom Brown, who grew up in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, kills his first animal under the apprenticeship of an Apache Indian uh, elderly man that he befriends. And, and Tom brings this animal back to the camp and he's weeping as he's killed this deer. And, and this man who he calls grandfather says, when you understand that in order for something to live, something else must die and this is the way of life, you will understand this. How is the life of a deer different than the life of a blade of grass? And to most of us in 2020, that statement might sound absurd, but at some spiritual level, life is life. <laughs> And in order for life to continue, life consumes life. And I think that there's, there's a spiritual sort of cycle here that, that in nature, every day, things are dying and getting eaten. <laughs> and whether it's, you know, whether it's a, a deer outside of your house in Norway eating lichen uh, in order to live or a, a plant, um, you know, having a symbiosis with a fungus or a fungus eating a deer after the deer dies or a worm, you know, like there's life and death happening all the time. And I, I've always sort of thought, you know, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to participate in this cycle. We just need to do it intentionally. There's really no way not to participate in that cycle. And I know that in plant-based vegan ideology, often they'll kind of rationalize their way out of that in some, you know, some spiritually with virtue and I'll leave that to them to do <laughs> respectfully. But, you know, I think that spending time in nature and and hunting will really help people have a sense of their place within this, this really this, um, this unescapable cycle and, and, and really see how beautiful it is. So that's really awesome you're gonna do that. And I can't wait to hear how you like liver. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to trying it. And you know, a lot of people, when I made the video talking about I'm gonna, that I'm gonna start hunting, a lot of people were just making fun of it because it's not sustainable for the whole planet to go hunt deer, right? And, and I understand that. And, and you know, you can only do what you can. And um, it's, I'm not saying that all people that eat meat should only be hunting their meat uh, because that's just not the reality of um, you know, the, the, the situation, you know, <laughs> you know, we have almost 8 billion people on the planet, so that's not gonna work. But there's always a way to make you know, your food supply and, and you know, sourcing your food that is uh, a little bit closer to how things would happen in nature. And hopefully you know, with the, the, the progression of uh, regenerative farming, like you've talked about in the past, hopefully we will get to a place where this is scalable and everyone has access to that. And of course, I think that everyone should actually go visit the farm that you're sourcing your meat from. Like, you know, get some sort of connection, some sort of real experience that kind of allows you to see where the food is coming from. And if you're eating tofu all the time, go to the, the you know, the monocrop uh, soy uh, fields as well, see what that feels like. And and you kind of get an idea what, where your food is coming from. I think it's really important. Like you're saying, being thankful and grateful for your food is such an important, um, you know, part of eating. I mean, I, so so many vegans in particular, and anyone in general in the Western society is just mindlessly eating empty calories, you know, day after day, and they're not even, you know, they, they have no sense of uh, appreciation for it. It's just a, a given, right? And we're such a privileged situation where the, the world is kind of overfed rather than under, underfed for the first time ever. And people are just, you know, taking it as a given and not really understanding how lucky and blessed we are to have this abundance of food. Um, and in terms of like, you know, actual, um, you know, food production and stuff, I think it's really important for everyone to realize that, you know, just because you're not able to source your meats in a way that you want to, you know, does that mean that you are a bad person for buying a factory farmed burger or, or, you know, ground beef? Not really, because this is the system that we have created as a, you know, a human population. This is a system that is in place and we can't judge and criticize and hate people for doing something that is, you know, the norm that is right in front of them. Um, so this is a kind of like a, a thing that I don't want to fall in the trap of judging people for choosing things that I'm not choosing just because of, you know, maybe lower income or, um, depending on where they live geographically 
and how well they can source their own food. And like everyone is on their own journey and, you know, everyone should respect uh, each other for that. Well said, very well said. And I think that one of the things that I've thought about is that there's really nothing sustainable about 7 billion people on the earth, no matter how you (laughs) cut it. There's nothing sustainable about monocrop agriculture. There's nothing sustainable about anything that we're doing now with 7 billion people on this planet. So yes, 7 billion people could not go hunt, but also 7 billion people can't keep eating monocrop agriculture. Uh, We're in the bugaboo and whether it happens within our generation or our children's children's generation, we are going to be faced with some really severe choices about how to continue as humans on this planet. On the podcast I did with Rob Wolf and Diana Rogers, We repeatedly said, the earth is going to be fine. The ecosystems of this earth, nature, quote unquote, will be fine. The only question is whether humans will persist on this planet. So nature is going to be fine. It's just a question of how humans will continue. So now let's move on to some of these studies because as you, I want to break these down. And this was actually your idea, which I think is fantastic to just talk about some of the studies that are used in plant-based circles to support their claims. And of course, you know, we don't have a a totally plant-based doctor here with us. So our views may be biased, but I want to talk about what's interesting about these studies and how they fall short and, and maybe show some studies that, that are um, counter to these or that help complete the picture of these studies. But certainly as you were doing your vegan journey, you became such a prominent figure that you got in touch with many of the most prominent vegan physicians. And I'm sure you were able to ask them, hey, what is the science that supports these? And so Mm -hmm. let's go through some of these studies that that you've been um, given by these vegan physicians to support this position from a health perspective. We've talked a lot about the ethics so far and talk about what's valuable and what's lacking in these studies. Which one do you want to start with? Yeah, so just to preface this whole conversation, I, you know, what I don't enjoy is when plant-based doctors um, and influencers and public figures use the studies that we have available um, today and claim that the vegan diet has been proven to, you know, be the most optimal diet for human health or that the vegan diet is the only diet ever shown to reverse heart disease or these big, big claims that unfortunately a lot of people, a lot of doctors use um, to promote the vegan lifestyle. And I understand there is an ethical bias in every single one of these doctors because they're vegan for ethical reasons, but it doesn't justify manipulating the data and, um, you know, misinforming the public about this whole thing. I mean, you got Neil Bernard going on London Real uh, and comparing eating meat to, you know, smoking cigarettes or eating cheese to taking heroin. I mean, how are parents of, of kids who are, you know, being fed meat and animal products going to feel like, you know, if there's this physician telling them that they're essentially, you know, promoting lung cancer in their, you know, in their babies and children. Um, it's just a counterproductive and a, a false statement. And a lot of um, these people, I feel like, need to take responsibility for the actual evidence that we have. And the reason why I wanted to do this with you is not because, you know, I I think that there is no value um, for vegan diets. I still believe that some people can be optimally healthy on a vegan diet until I see, you know, my own family and friends failing. Um, This is my perspective. But I do also know that there's a lot of people who cannot and who do experience uh, side effects, right? So but the most important thing I want to get out of this conversation is just going through the data and going through the main um, points that we have, the main studies, and the most cited studies by all these uh, professionals, and kind of, uh, kind of tell people what they do say, what they don't say, what they may suggest, what they may not suggest. And I think w- and me and you both can agree that the nutrition science today is, you know, is far from giving us a kind of clear picture of what is 100% optimal and what is not 100% optimal. And, you know, it, it's not a reflective of, you know, the truth, the objective truth out there. Yes, I totally agree. And I think that there's, there's a lot of nuance here and we do our best to show um, both sides of it and to show what's valuable about these studies and to show their shortcomings and then to show um, things, studies which can complement these and perhaps suggest that some of them are extreme claims. Now, I like what you're saying there and I think we'll get into a lot of this if we have time that, that I've seen the same thing, that many of the vegan doctors will make claims based on very poorly done studies without control groups or based on epidemiology. But 
Should we start with some of the randomized controlled trials? I think these are probably the ones that are most interesting to, to both of us because they are randomized and controlled. And it's important yeah. to point out that there are randomized controlled trials of vegan diets, which do show yeah. benefit. Now, I, I would like to talk about these for you or with you and the audience and show what's valuable about them and then what the shortcomings are and what they're really showing us. Um, because unfortunately, like you're suggesting, many plant-based advocates would say, look, the vegan diet has clearly been shown to do this. And it's like, well, let's talk about the nuance here. Right. So often the nuance is lost. So it's really, it's really, I think, does a lot of disservice to this. So do you want to start with the, the plant-based diet intervention improves beta cell function and insulin resistance, or is there another one you want to start with? Uh, yeah, let's do that one. Okay. So I'll pull it up here on the screen. This one is um, quite an interesting one. Now, there are too many of these studies to really talk about in this podcast um, without making it three plus hours, um, but we'll go over some of the randomized controlled trials. This one was interesting to me. What did you think of this one, John? Uh, well, you know, this, this is a very, you know, this is one of the most cited ones and, and just, uh, you know, the Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine and Neil Bernard and his work is probably one of the most cited studies um, and, and kind of randomized trials in the vegan community to my knowledge. Um, you know, and, you know, they do show some benefits and they, they show that the, you know, the intervention group actually improves while the control group, you know, doesn't. Um, but they're like, like any kind of study, you know, no matter if it's a randomized trial or epidemiology, there are def definitely some big holes. And a lot of times when you just hear, oh, Neil Bernard has a randomized controlled trial. Um, and you think, well, you know, randomized controlled trials are pretty high up in the hierarchy of evidence. They, they're, you know, pretty high power. Uh, it must be amazing. But the fact is that you can have, uh, you know, a lot of nuance and a lot of question marks, even after randomized controlled trials. It's not, you know, the gold standard, you know, be all end all of, of nutrition and, and science. Um, but, you know, there are some good, you know, things about this study. And I think, you know, what stood out to me the most um, of this study um, was that, you know, the, the, the people who were fed a low fat vegan diet, although, you know, their LDL dropped, they also dropped, you know, other markers that are probably not beneficial for cardiovascular disease, even though this was for diabetes, you know, we can't ignore all other, you know, consequences of um, dietary interventions, right? So um, along with, you know, getting, um, you know, benefits for diabetes, they also showed some markers that I think, you know, may be problematic for cardiovascular disease, like higher trig triglycerides, or, you know, fat in the blood, um, and lower HDL levels as well which was pretty interesting, which I was not expecting on a low fat vegan diet. And as, as you and I were reviewing a lot of these randomized controlled trials on vegan diets, it was a pattern that we saw repeatedly that um, on a low fat vegan diet, I think almost every single one of the RCTs that you and I had emailed about, there was a, an increase in triglycerides and a, and a decrease in HDL. So this study is interesting. Like you said, there were 75 participants randomized to a low fat plant-based diet or to make no dietary change. So right there, what we're comparing, just so people understand, is a low-fat plant-based diet. Low-fat is important, as we'll see in a moment, to basically the standard American diet, right? right. So this is, this is interesting, right? And, and as you and I agreed, a low-fat vegan diet may be better than the standard American diet. And what's interesting for me about this study is that these are people who do not have diabetes, so these are people with no history of diabetes, and they looked at the beta cell function, which they estimated using the HOMA IR model while fasting. Now, <clears throat> some interesting things really jumped out for me at this one, which were that um, changes in glucose-induced insulin secretion correlated negatively with BMI changes, but not with changes in visceral fat. Um, beta cell function and insulin sensitivity were significantly improved through a low-fat plant-based diet in, over in overweight adults. And if you look at the actual data, what you'll find here is that when they did this study, so I know this is a complex chart, but I'll just show people. So this is the control group. This is the intervention group. And both groups did reduce calories. In many of the other randomized controlled trials that you and I will talk about in this podcast, 
the vegan group reduced calories, but the control group did not reduce calories, or the vegan group reduced calories more. A lot of these trials with vegan studies are not designed to be isocaloric, which introduces a very confusing compounding variable, and we can talk about why based on another study in a moment. But in this group, the baseline group started out with 1,900 calories a day. They went down to 1,582. The control group, 1,851 the intervention group 1450. So both group reduced calories at about the same. But what you'll find here, and this is actually why I wanna highlight this, is that the visceral fat volume, something I've been talking about a lot on my podcast recently, which is the amount of fat inside the peritoneum in the stomach, did not reduce in the control group, but it did reduce in the intervention group. So this is actually a really striking finding. If I were a plant-based physician, I would look at this and go, this is really cool. A plant-based diet clearly improves visceral fat volume, which it does appear to in this, in this study, over the standard American diet. Now, over the standard American diet. And if you look here at the bottom, you can see that the HOMA IR, which is a calculated score, doesn't really change. It actually goes up, which is a bad thing in the control group, and it goes down in the intervention group. So the investigators, I think, are, are selling this story properly. They're saying, look, a low-fat vegan diet decreased visceral fat and improved insulin sensitivity. Now, the next part of which portion of the vegan diet did this is the most important part. I think that Neil Barnard and the folks in the plant-based community would say, this is because of the exclusion of animal products. But there are multiple interventions here. It wasn't calories, but the thing that you and I highlighted was that if you look at the polyunsaturated fatty acid intake in these two groups, the base, the control group decreased a little bit, but the intervention group decreased their polyunsaturated fatty acids much more, much more than the control group. Because remember, this is a low fat vegan diet. And all of these RCTs that you and I found were low fat vegan diets, meaning that as part of this intervention, this is what's so complicated about nutritional studies. These people are not only remo removing animal products, they're also removing vegetable oils. So we could draw a lot of potential conclusions. We can make hypotheses based on this study. You could say, hypothesis number one, the removal of animal products leads to reduction in visceral fat. Okay, that's a hypothesis. Hypothesis number two, the removal of polyunsaturated fatty acids leads to, the, leads to visceral fat volume loss and insulin improvement. Now those are both hypotheses. And the problem with these studies is, when we do a nutritional study, we come out with like five different things that we then have to sequen sequentially test or subsequently test. And the problem is that these are rarely tested. Now, what's pretty right. cool here is that there has been an interesting study that really tests this exact question. And I emailed this to you right before the podcast, so I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but is it okay if I just share this one real quick, John? Go for it. So... If we are asking the question, is it the, is it the calorie restriction or is it the meat, which isn't quite what we're asking in this study because that was really the polyunsaturated fat or the meat, then we, this is a great, interesting study. So this is, um, this is actually in humans and the title is Potential Effects of a Reduced Red Meat Compared with Increased Fiber Intake on Glucose Metabolism and Liver Fat Content a randomized and controlled dietary intervention study. So this is a cool study because it kind of advances this question. And they'll show here epidemiological studies, which you and I will talk about, suggest that increased red meat is associated with a higher risk of type 2 diabetes. But as, as you and I and the listener will know, just because it's associated doesn't mean it causes it. So they did an interventional study over six months and all of the groups decreased their calorie intake by 400 kcals. The control group just had a caloric deficit, and there was a group that had no red meat, and there was a group that increased fiber. And at the end, what they found was striking. Glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity improved and body and visceral mass decreased in all groups. In all groups, these changes did not differ between the groups. And this is looking at glucose sensitivity, tolerance, body, visceral mass, essentially the same outcomes as the previous study, and their conclusion is striking. Our data indicate that caloric restriction leads to a marked improvement in glucose metabolism and body fat composition, including liver fat content, and that 
when you take meat out, it did nothing else. There seems to be no additional beneficial impact of reduced red meat and increased fiber intake on improvement in cardiometabolic parameters. So this starts to really ask some major questions about these vegan trials. Um, is it the removal of red meat or is it the reduction in calories in some of the other RCTs that we'll see? And in this first study, is it possible that it's actually the removal of polyunsaturated fats? Because there are a lot of studies like this one, the second one that I just showed that say, hey, you can get improvements in glucose parameters and loss of visceral fat when you're still eating meat. So I thought this is such an interesting um, takeaway here. Does, what do you think about all this, John? Does this make sense? And well, does, do you think this? Uh, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, this is, I, I think, you know, when it comes to getting favorable health outcomes, being on a caloric deficit, losing weight in general is going to, you know, be better. I, I believe that if people did a, you know, randomized trial, you know, uh, just like that one and, and included a McDonald's group where that was only eating McDonald's and junk food all day, but we're still on a 400 you know, calorie deficit, I believe that maybe they wouldn't get as great of a result, but they would still see improvements. So a calorie deficit you know, makes a huge difference. And a lot of times people gloss over that kind of um, you know, fact as well. Have you heard of the Twinkie diet, John? <laughs> no, I thought it was a joke. Is, is it real? <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> it's not a joke. So I'll show this. Uh, so this is crazy. So there was a professor, and this uh, is something that I talked about in my book um, a little bit. I don't think anyone is advocating for this type of a diet, but there's a professor, Mark Hobb, uh, who's a professional nutrition at Kansas State University. He lost 27 pounds in 10 weeks on exclusively Twinkies, Doritos, Oreos, and other treats <laughs> by ensuring that he consumed fewer calories than he burned. Yeah. Like, yeah. and of course, when they actually did um, his, his insulin markers, he did have improvements in insulin sensitivity. And so this is a really important point. Now, is anyone going to advocate for a diet of Twinkie, Oreos, and Doritos? No, because of massive nutrient deficiencies, long-term inflammation, all sorts of problems. But you really can see that if you have a caloric deficit, you can improve your insulin sensitivity just with a caloric deficit. So pretty interesting that you can do it on junk food. There's also something called the potato diet. And, mm. and people have argued that a carnivore diet works because it's a calorie deficit. And this is not true because there are many carnivores who are not losing weight, who have improvements in these things. And I just wanna go back to the first study that you and I talked about, which is that, that one with the insulin resistance in the vegan study. And note that in that study, People did not lose. Um, people did not lose weight, which is what's so interesting. If you look at this study, the overall BMI between these people did not change. So um, the it only changed a little bit. So I, sh I should correct myself. The BMI from the intervention group went from 33 to 31. Um, it was a little bit, and the BMI in the other group did not did not decrease substantially. So there was a small decrease in lean muscle mass, but most of the decrease was in the visceral fat volume. And, and as you see here, both groups decrease their calories, but by decreasing polyunsaturated fatty acids more, this group lost more visceral fat. This group didn't lose any fat and they kept their polyunsaturated fatty acids the same. So it's kind of a fascinating story that starts to unravel there that weight loss is important. Weight loss will improve your insulin sensitivity regardless of how you do it. And for vegan doctors to say, hey, the vegan diet does this, it's like, well, maybe, but let's test the hypothesis. And as that second study I showed illustrates, you can still include meat in your diet with caloric restriction and also improve your diabetes. So how can meat be causing diabetes, right? It's kind of crazy. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I think we have, I think, you know, when I looked for the most cited studies and most promoted st studies, um, they all kind of went back to these three people, uh, you know, Dean Ornish, uh, Neil Bernard, and Esselstyn, right? So um, all of these were very similar in, in, you know, the approach in terms of macronutrient breakdown. They had, you know, most of the time around 10% uh, of their calories coming from fats. And, you know, no, like no other big changes apart from the thing that you point out that is really important, I think, which is the elimination of 
uh, you know, linoleic acid and, um, you know, just vegetable oils in general. And you will see these plant-based doctors saying that, you know, vegetable oils are to be eliminated and that they're extremely unhealthy. And I think that is a really smart thing for them to say. And I 100% agree with them. And I've always spoken against the um, usage of oil uh, while cooking and et cetera. I mean, you know, I've always been about mo moderation and using some here and there is fine. But, um, you know, for health purposes, you know, oil does seem to have a lot of, um, you know, problems uh, related to it. And all these randomized controlled trials do account for that and try to minimize, um, you know, oil consumption as well as meat, uh, dairy, fish, and eggs and that kind of stuff. They're all so low fat vegan diets, right? Yeah. They're all low fat vegan diets. And so this is what's challenging about nutrition is we're changing six things. So yeah. Do you want to talk about this one next? Uh, this is another Neil Barnard study. Then we can talk about uh, Dean Ornish's one. So this one is interesting because just like we're saying, this is 11 subjects at Georgetown. It's Neil Barnard. And we can skip through it quickly, but their conclusion is the use of a low-fat vegetarian diet. This is a vegetarian diet. Was associated with significant reduction in serum glucose concentration and body weight um, in the absence of recommendations for exercise. And then if you look at the data, what do you find? Again, it's a small study. The, experiment, the experimental group cut their calories over 250 calories a day. And the control yeah. group actually increased their calories. <laughs> so it's like, and then you look here, you know, the percentage of fat in the, in the experimental group went from 34 to 11. And the percentage of fat in the control group didn't change at all. The reason I started with the other study looking at the beta cell function was because that's the only study that I found that actually showed a breakdown of um, the change in polyunsaturated fat. Uh, in mm -hmm. this study, Neil Barnard wants to point out saturated fat goes down, but that's very confusing. I wish he'd showed me polyunsaturated fat, and I'm sure that this decrease in fat was, um, I mean, it went from 34% of their baseline to 11% of their baseline. And I'm sure a large portion of that was also polyunsaturated fat intake. And I just think that we cannot ignore the very real beneficial, as you are saying, the very real beneficial point or part of these vegan ideologies is, is hey, cut out processed food, which is gonna have the vegetable oil in it. So anything else you notice on this study or do you wanna move on to the Dean Ornish studies? Let's, let's just do the Dean Ornish one, because I think I you know, want to focus a little bit on the uh, Epic Oxford, which is one of the most cited studies as well, which is more epidemiology, um, yeah. but it's a, it's a pretty interesting one. So let's just move on to the Dean Ornish um, one that we got. Yeah, yeah. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about these Dean Ornish ones? They're pretty... <laughs> Ornish is kind of the king of uh, doing 17 different things, yeah. isn't he? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the, the thing is, you know, when you, when you look at the, um, he, he's done, a, he's done several studies and he is a, a very big fan of lifestyle intervention in general. And diet is only a small, you know, aspect of that. I mean, it's important, but it's, it's not the most, or arguably maybe not the most important, uh, because, you know, you will see in these studies that they get their, you know, patients to stop smoking. They get their patients to, uh, de-stress by, you know, doing meditation, yoga, um, and these things that really help uh, with, you know, mental health and relaxation and reduce stress levels, as well as, um, you know, putting them on a vegetarian diet. I, I think some of them included small amounts of fish. I'm not sure if that's true or not, um, but I don't think they were 100% vegan, but they were low-fat vegan diets. Um, and again, when you're saying, when you're citing this study and, and sending this to me and saying that, Dean Ornish proves that a vegan diet reverses coronary, you know, artery lesions or, you know, reverses heart disease in, in, in general, um, you know, because, you know, it, it, there are so many confounding factors and so many different um, interventions at the same time, it's almost impossible to say which was a more powerful intervention. And again, you know, this was a short trial as well. Um, so, you know, it, it, again, when people are sending these short-term interventional studies for a specific disease outcome, it really, really translates into long-term optimal health. And this is what a lot of people do. They use these, um, you know, RCTs that show favorable outcomes for, you know, uh, coronary heart disease or whatever. And they conclude that the vegan diet or a low-fat vegetarian diet or a plant-based diet is 
you know, the optimal diet for human health. So, um, yeah, just too many, you know, confounding factors here, too many interventions at the same time. Um, and, you know, why that was, I don't know. Maybe he understood from previous trials that just doing a purely, you know, a low fat vegan diet maybe didn't have enough. Uh, of a positive result to market to people or to get more clients or whatever. I don't know what the reason is, but you know, if you really want to get to the bottom of something, you don't lump in, you know, 10 different interventions and, you know, you know, say that everything is everything of the, all the positive outcomes were because of the dietary intervention and not the stopping smoking or stress management and, and daily exercise and these things meditation support groups. Yeah. I actually heard Dean Ornish talk at a conference uh, one time uh, when I was doing my functional medicine training. And, and he himself said, and this is just his opinion, that he felt like it was the community aspect of these trials that was the most effective. Now, that's neither here nor there. It's just his opinion. Uh, he's certainly a plant-based advocate. But what we have to be very careful of is saying, hey, you guys changed six things. <laughs> You had people stop smoking, they lost weight, they exercised, they got community, they got stress reduction counseling, and they did a low-fat vegan diet or low-fat vegetarian diet, which in and of itself is seven interventions. Can you really then say that it's red meat that causes prostate cancer or red meat that causes heart disease? Like, that doesn't make any sense. That, that's a little too, um, that's too, too much extrapolation in my opinion. So I think we can just leave those at, at that and move on to... Epic Oxford, because yeah. I know you want to get to that study. Yeah, just a, one, one of the things that I wanted to comment again is, is again, for almost all, apart from one uh, RCT that I saw uh, on low-fat vegan diets, I was extremely surprised by the, you know, the increased triglyceride levels and uh, the, the, the lowering of HDL. That was a consistent pattern that I saw um, in all, almost all of the RCTs. And that is really strange. I, I, I kept wondering, you know, what could be the reason for that? Because I've got my blood work done and I never, you know, adhered to a low fat vegan diet. I was always on the 20 to 30 percent of my calories from fat. So, you know, I never, you know, I was wondering if, if that may be the reason. Like, you know, do you have any theories behind why that could happen? You know, why triglycerides may increase so much with increased carbohydrates, lowering of fat? Because that <laughs> it was really something that took me by surprise. I mean, the, the increases are consistent. They're not huge, but they're pretty consistent. Yeah. I think that what, I think that it's actually, I think that it has to do with polyunsaturated fatty acids and, and perhaps a lowering of saturated fat. Um, you, one of the things that's interesting is when you include healthy saturated fats in your diet, HDL will go up and triglycerides tend to go down. Now, LDL will also go up. And LDL is this demonized molecule that everyone worries about. Yeah. And I've done many, many podcasts about why we are very myopic with regard to that. But I think that in some people, pushing carbohydrates super high is going to increase triglycerides. And whether or not that's a problem is questionable because insulin resistance markers do seem to improve. But the yeah. lowering of HDL is probably potentially an, a removal of saturated fat. Now, as I talked about in a recent podcast with um, uh, the paleocardiologist, Jack Wolfson, uh, you know, we don't have great indices or great measures to actually look at HDL function. So is lowered HDL a bad thing? We can't say that for sure, but it's, it's certainly a pattern that you wouldn't want to see um, long-term happening in humans. And again, our lipid measures are basically very, um, very, very crude at this point. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I'll just mention before we move on to Epic Oxford, and I've talked about studies like this multiple times in the past, is that there are many studies which do not show inflammatory uh, effects of red meat in humans. And this is what I use to kind of counter or counterpoint the vegan studies and say, okay, if you believe that it's the removal of red meat or the removal of animal products that is causing the improvements in your studies, then why does increasing red meat not elevate markers of oxidative stress or inflammation in humans? And this is one of my favorite studies. If, you, if you've seen this study, again, I talked about this when I talked about it, the podcast with James Wilkes, 60 participants, eight week parallel study designed, they ate their usual diet or they replaced energy from carbohydrate rich, rich foods with 200 grams per day of lean red meat in isoenergetic diets. So they ate 200 grams, that's half a pound of red meat per day in place of carbohydrates. And what did they find after they measured stress, oxidative stress and inflammation, they found that the red meat um, 
resulted in lower levels of inflammatory markers, a trend for lower C-reactive protein concentrations, and no differences in concentrations of F2 isoprostanes, serum amyloid A, uh, or plasma fibrinogen. So our results suggest that partial replacement of dietary carbohydrate with protein from lean red meat does not elevate oxidative stress or inflammation. So this is always like left me scratching my head. I mean, I kind of I kind of want you to send this study back to Michael Greger and see what he would say about it. <laughs> I don't know if he would respond to you right now, but like, how can it, I just, it doesn't add up to me. Have you seen this one? Uh, I have not seen this particular study, no. Um, I do know that a lot of people in the plant-based community will say that meat and all animal products uh, will are pl- pro-inflammation, right? Right. Um, and they, they will throw in that oil and gluten are as well, uh, but that meat and animal products are extremely inflammatory. Um, but when you look at it, and we talked about this, um, you know, um, right before we were recording, that there's so many foods that do, you know, induce some level of inflammation in our bodies. I mean, eating is not, you know, something that is, you know, a zero tax kind of game for our bodies. Our bodies need to work and break things down. And, and, you know, every time you eat, you are kind of, you know, you are inducing some damage that then, you know, becomes uh, repaired later on. But, you know, it's not unusual to see, you know, some markers of inflammation go up regardless. I mean, like most foods, I guess you would eat, uh, you would see some sort of changes in different inflammation markers temporarily, right? So yeah, yeah, it's just one of those things that a lot of people misunderstand, I guess. And there are some studies, if people look immediately postprandially, you sometimes will see inflammatory markers go up. But what's interesting about this study, this was an eight week parallel study design, and they're looking, you know, they're looking overall at the fasting markers. Mm-hmm. You, oh, that's really what you have to do. You can't really look at postprandial markers of inflammation yeah. with eating because as you point out, almost every food that humans eat is going to induce some postprandial inflammation. It's just part, part of our body's response. You are introducing into your body trillions of bacteria and all these foreign particles. You're introducing food into your gut. There's going to be some postprandial inflammation no matter what you eat, basically. So postprandial inflammation is not a good metric. And how many of those studies actually, have you ever seen a study that compared postprandial inflammation levels in, uh, with meat versus other foods? I've never seen it. I've seen people compare flow mediated dilatation, which is something I've talked about previously, looking at the way an artery contracts and expands, but that's a very poor metric. Postprandial flow mediated dilatation is not a good metric of inflammation. And I've never seen a study where people looked postprandially and gave someone like a banana or a piece of broccoli and compared it to red meat. Um, but if anyone's aware of that, please send it to us. We'd love to see it. So yeah, so that's an interesting thing to me that, that there's really no evidence that I've seen that, that red meat causes any inflammation. There's lots of studies to show that. So let's talk about some of these epidemiology studies. And I want to be mindful mm-hmm. of your time. So just let me know when you have to jump <laughs> off. Do you have 10 yeah, no. minutes? Do you have I, to go- yeah, I, I, got, I got time. I can make more time. It doesn't matter too much. Okay. We can go over. Um, Yeah, so, you know, the Oxford Epic is a study that I've promoted in the past as well um, as a vegan um, because of the sheer number of participants. Um, I believe there are all, you know, UK-based people, um, and this is a huge number of people. Now, I don't know what the original number was when they started the study, um, and there are very like there's so many different papers on the same exact study, so it's hard to find um, you know the actual updated numbers. Um, but it's one of the most cited for uh, showing how um, you know vegetarian slash vegan diets are protective against all cause mortality and cardiovascular disease and many different types of cancer, right? Um, and I find that a lot of people in the nutrition space and also um, in the vegan uh, health space, they favor epidemiology over a lot of you know different studies. Um, and as most people know, if you've done a little bit of research um, into what different you know kind of study uh, designs there are and their limitations, it's it's not too hard to find what the you know the holes could potentially be in these large epidemiology studies. And a lot of times, people use these um, relative risk numbers as uh, and mix and and make the mistake of just saying the percentage without 
you know, <laughs> saying what that means in context of the specific study and the numbers of people studied. Um, so people will say, you know, vegetarians have a 15%, um, you know, uh, less risk than meat eaters of developing heart disease or for all cause mortality. Um, and they just stop there, right? And it sounds like, you know, you're saving a lot of lives if 15% less people in the world who are vegetarian, they would, you know, they would save millions and millions of lives. But in reality, that is a relative risk um, versus absolute risk, which would be completely different. Um, and I'm sure this is something that you've talked a lot about, but I, I think it's an important thing just to start there because a lot of these percentages are a bit misleading for people who, who have never heard about these um, ways of analyzing statistics. Yeah, and, and from the beginning, we have now shifted into the very dark, murky, muddy land of epidemiology. The first few studies we were looking at were all interventional. And, and just so people understand the difference, an interventional study is when you take a control group and an experimental group and you do something to them. You remove meat, you give them a low-fat vegan diet, or you add meat, or you cut calories. We talked about a number of interventional studies. As you suggest, in, it's been a, a point of consternation for me that most of the vegan and vegetarian proponent physicians that I've talked about will always revert to epidemiology, which is a very different type of study. This is a survey-based study. So mm -hmm. it's, it's important that people understand these, these words. So when they say here, this is a, it's a cohort study, meaning it's epidemiology. This is a prospective cohort study. It did have a lot of people that had 48,188 participants yeah. with no history of ischemic heart disease, stroke, or chest pain, which is angina, right? And so what they do is they take those people, that's how many people they ended with, they probably started with more, they yeah. take those people and they give them a survey. And you actually sent me this survey, so mm -hmm. this is really cool. Once a year. So they'll, they'll give people a survey and they'll ask them in the beginning how much meat they eat, or they'll, then they'll follow them over time and give them surveys uh, every once in a while. And so there is no intervention here. There's no intervention. These are people living their life normally. They're getting a survey. Do you eat any meat? Bacon, ham, poultry, game, meat pie, sausage. This is the actual questionnaire from Epic, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, you notice something interesting about this. Uh, what did you notice about this uh, this this uh, this survey questionnaire, John? Well, many things. I mean, first of all, just just thinking about how this questionnaire is submitted once a year is already pr problematic, right? Because like, how how good do you think people's memory memories are in terms of how much of each food category and each kind of like <laughs> subcategory they have eaten and how many hours of cleaning they've done around the house, how many hours of exercise and and uh, how many cigarettes they've smoked during the, the, the last 365 days. It's impossible to have accurate memory on this. So uh, already there, you can see a problem with, you know, the way that you, we're gather, gathering data. It's not to say that it's garbage and we can't use it to some, um, you know, advantage and, and to come to some hypotheses, but to use it as, you know, as a, as a, you know, promoter of truth and fact is really silly when you see these limitations. So how many, like, you know, it's not like people, if, if people were 48,000 people were logging their food in into chronometer.com and, and all of their nutrients were analyzed each day, you know, it would be a little bit different, but this, you know, they don't even specify sometimes if, you know, the yogurt has, you know, some sort of uh, additives or sugar or or anything like that. They just say yogurt. They just said bread um, and you know different types of breads and that kind of stuff. Um, and it doesn't really give us a really good picture, right? It's it's really limited. Um, and also um, in terms of you know what they actually you know scan for is um, how much they've um, you know worked out and what type of meats. And they 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 seem to be really hyper focused on how well you cook the meat and also what type of meat you're eating if it's saturated fat or cholesterol or uh, you know um you know red meat or the, or something like that and they expect you to know the exact um you know amounts and just think about for a second if you're maybe struggling with self-esteem or or if you have a bad relationship to food and you finally decide that you're going to take control of your health and you're involved in this epic study and the questionnaire finally comes to your door and you know that you know <laughs> you haven't been too good uh, in the last year how 
how likely is it that you are going to be so honest with yourself that you're going to write down the exact amounts of time that you had a cookie or a sugary drink or, you know, some sort of junk food. Uh, you know, you would be embarrassed to write down the truth that you had, you know, 14 meals a day that was processed. You would not write that even if you understood that you are an unhealthy person psychologically and, you know, relating to shame and guilt and these things. We can't rely on people's psychology to report accurate information about these things. And that is, I think, one of the main problems with this study. Yeah, the accuracy of food frequency questionnaires has been drawn into drawn into question many, <laughs> many times. And in fact, um, I've posted about this before in the past, but it's important for people to know that this is a survey, right? And so this is an actual study looking at the relative validation of a food frequency questionnaire to estimate food oh, okay. intake in an adult population. This is not looking at specifically Epic Oxford, but it's a study from 2017. And so just as John is suggesting, more than half of the food groups mm -hmm were overestimated in the food frequency questionnaire, especially vegetables and fruits. <laughs> right. Water, tea, and coffee were underestimated. Uh, corrected correlations between two instruments ranged from 0.27 for carbohydrates, 0.55 for protein. And so basically what they're saying is that, um, that, that they're not really that valid, um, that, that they're having quite a bit of variability in terms of recall. This is like basically, Remember that game when you were growing up, memory, where people would turn over different cards? You're, you're asking people every year to play a game of memory about what they've eaten. Now, that's, that's the data that this is based on, you guys. And then furthermore, this is 17,000 different variables. We can only draw a correlation. And so if you've heard that expression, garbage in, garbage out, epidemiology studies are never meant to draw causality or make causal inference. They're only meant to draw correlation from which you can do interventional experiments. And yet, in vegetarian and vegan plant-based communities, they will repeatedly hold up these studies, which is only one set of the epidemiology. Mm -hmm. John and I will share the other side of the epidemiology in a moment. They'll repeatedly hold up these studies and say, look, this shows that those who eat more vegetables and less meat do better, except it doesn't really. So based on all of that sort of shaky ground, <laughs> what does Epic Oxford actually show, John? Well, you know, the, the, the very strange thing is, and I, I don't understand why so many vegans recommend this study, because, you know, unfortunately, even though the meat eaters were just way more unhealthy at baseline when they started this study, you know, way less activity, way more, um, you know, uh, uh, alcohol, more smoking, uh, way higher blood pressure and these things, even, you know, with all that considered, um, a lot of times we see, um, you know, some, some of these uh, numbers being higher uh, for, you know, stroke in particular for vegetarians and even higher for vegans uh, when they analyze and, and divide vegetarians and vegans because most of the time they group vegetarians and vegans together. Um, but a lot of times they, they really come on top in terms of stroke and um, for the rest, not much of a difference. Um, you know, for ischemic heart disease, vegetarians seem to have a slightly lower rate um, but it wasn't, you know, massive. And then, uh, uh, for stroke and different types of strokes, vegetarians seem to have a higher, um, rate of, uh, of that, even though that's, it's still not a significant difference. Right. But it's, it's, it was interesting to see that, you know, vegetarians, even though they had much healthier behavior and depending on which analysis you see of the study, uh, it depends what kind of, um, you know, variables people control for when they're doing these breakdowns. But, um, you know, it, it seems like all of those healthy habits that a lot of times these vegetarians possess over meat eaters, it doesn't really help them that much in protecting against uh, stroke in particular, it seems. Yeah, I thought it was striking that, so this is the, the graph I was showing. If people are not familiar with this, this is looking at the, the hazard ratio. They're using meat eaters as a baseline at one, and then if it goes to the right, there's a greater risk, and if it goes to the left, there's a lower risk. And you can see there's a square with these error bars and the error bars represent what we call the confidence interval and 95% confidence interval. So in terms of med medicine and statistics, if, this, if, this, if these error bars cross the middle line, we say it's not statistically significant because, and you'll see that because the p-value will be very high, which means it's not statistically significant. So what you'll see here <laughs> is that 
is that if you just, and granted, this is based on the fact that this is very sketchy epidemiology, you can look at the study and say, fish eaters and vegetarians do tend to have lower rates of ischemic heart disease. Now, as John and I will unpack here in a moment, is this due to the fact they're excluding meat or is it due to other healthy behaviors that they are also doing? But what often gets ignored is that if you look at hemorrhagic stroke and total stroke, vegetarians do much worse. And this error bar doesn't cross the middle line, meaning that there's a very significant increase in hemorrhagic stroke and total stroke in vegetarians. But, and, and if you actually look at this, um, the all-cause mortality in Epic Oxford is not significantly different between any of these three groups. And so yeah. now it, you can break it down by individual diseases, but the all-cause mortality was no different in this epidemiology study, but you won't hear vegans and vegetarians talk about that. So you'll see it in the conclusions. And I, I just don't understand how anyone on the plant-based side can hold this study up as a good thing, because though dying of a heart attack is not something that any of us want, certainly dying of a stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke is, is, not, um, is not a good thing either. And say, they'll show, they say in this prospective cohort in the UK, fish eaters and vegetarians had, the, had lower rates of ischemic heart disease than meat eaters, although vegetarians had higher rates of hemorrhagic and total stroke. And that's not a good thing. The other thing to notice here mm -hmm. is that in other subgroup analyses, like John mentioned, you can look at the fracture risk in vegetarians and non-vegetarians in this same cohort, and there's a higher fracture risk in the vegans. Mm -hmm. yeah. Appeared to be a consequence of their considerably lower calcium intake. So mm -hmm. again, the, the first Epic Oxford study that we showed was just looking at the ischemic heart disease, stroke, hemorrhagic stroke. There's all these other subgroup analyses, and in this study, you can see that the um, that they had a higher risk of fractures. So again, yeah. that's not a good thing either because anyone knows, anyone who has an elderly grandparent knows that a fracture of the hip can mean massive you know, complications later on. Now, the other thing I wanna just point out here is this website. I don't know if you've seen this one, John. It's pretty amazing. Uh, spurious correlations. So no, I haven't. This is just to point out that correlation is not causation. I talk uh, about this okay. in my book a little bit. You can yeah. look at the correlation between the number of people who drowned by falling into a, peel, uh, into a pool with the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in per year. <laughs> and there's a very strong correlation here. Or you can look at the per capita cheese consumption with the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. Does that mean that these are in any way, shape, or form related? not really. They're correlated. In fact, the correlation here is 94.71%, but they can't possibly be causal. Are people eating cheese while they're in the bed and that's why they're becoming tangled in the bed sheets? It doesn't make any sense. This is just, yeah. a, this is just a comedic illustration of the fact that correlation does not make causation. And in this study, it's very confusing. So um, anything else you want to point out about Epic Oxford? I mean, is, did people really, when you were thinking that this was a good study, mm -hmm. was it just that, was, were the stroke findings just overlooked? Yeah, um, <laughs> basically. I mean, you know, I, I think the, again, the issue is like when, when epidemiology works in your favor, you go with it when it, when it doesn't, you blame it on the fact that it's epidemiology, right? So um, that's the issue with, you know, having a fixed belief system and mindset is that you don't allow that flexibility and um, these um, conversations to happen. So I think it wasn't so much that I, <clears throat> you know, wasn't able to read these studies. It was just that I didn't want to look uh, too deeply into them, I think, because I was allowing my anecdotal experience and, um, you know, my own view of, of uh, the world and how it should be dictate what I thought was credible information and was not credible information. And again, I'm not saying that epidemiology is, is garbage. There is definitely, you know, a, a opportunity to use epidemiology as a tool to get different hypotheses, um, you know, drawn down. And then again, like you're saying, uh, make more um, interventional studies based on these, uh, on those hypotheses from, you know, epidemiology and that kind of stuff. And, and I think it should be used as a tool. 
and and people unfortunately use it as as proof for so many different things that they shouldn't and again there are many different cohort or um, you know uh, prospective cohort studies like this in asia that you know show kind of the opposite effect you know the more meat intake the more saturated effect uh saturated fat uh, has a positive effect on different cancers and, and uh, stroke and heart disease so uh, you can find a lot of epidemiology supporting um you know different things and it, it doesn't necessarily give us a clear picture of what is really going on so this is one of the studies that you mentioned to me that i pulled up possible protective effect of milk meat and fish from cerebrovascular disease mm. mortality in Japan. In yeah, this and that was like 250,000 people or something. Yeah, 223,000 women and mm. yeah, crazy. And they say the risk of mortality from cerebrovascular disease, right? This is, this is uh, brain disease, inversely associated with dairy, milk, meat, and fish consumption. So that's, you know, that's in Asia and epidemiology shows something completely different. But Mm -hmm. but it's never talked about. And then the other one that I've pointed out repeatedly and talked about in my book is um, another one done in Asia, which I will show in a moment, which shows that, that the, um, in Asia across multiple studies, those who eat the most, those, the men who eat the most red meat have the lowest rates of cardiovascular disease. And the women right. who eat the low, the most red meat have the lowest amount of um, have the lowest amount of cancer. And so this is really the danger of epidemiology is yeah. what are we really looking at here and how do we make sense of this? So this is meat intake and all and cause specific mortality, a pooled analysis of Asian prospective cohort studies. So the same type of study as Epic Oxford, this is, um, you know, 1200 men, 184,000 women followed for six to 15 years and they said that they found that red meat consumption was substantially lower in Asian countries than in the United States. Fish and seafood consumption was higher in Japan and Korea than in the US. They found no association between total meat intake, red meat, poultry, fish, and seafood, and risks of all cause cardiovascular disease or cancer. And they found furthermore that, um, that the, the men, uh, who ate the most red meat. So red meat intake was inversely associated with CBD mortality in men and with cancer mortality in women in Asian countries. What? So if, we're, yeah. if we wanna start comparing epidemiology, it's like, well, this epidemiology shows one thing. This epidemiology study shows a completely different thing. As I've said before, I think it's more about the narrative in that country than anything else. The idea that in Asia, Red meat and meat is associated with affluence. And so who eats meat? People who are affluent. But in the U.S. for the last 70 years, thanks to Ansel Keys, go back to the podcast I did with Nina Teicholz, we've been told that red meat is bad for us. And so who eats red meat? People that are doing less healthy behaviors. And, and so that's the problem with epidemiology is it really shows us clearly that whether we're looking at cardiovascular disease, cancer, or cerebrovascular disease, we simply cannot base large population decisions or decisions about what the most optimal diet is for humans on epidemiology. And yet, as you've seen firsthand, that's what most of the vegan physicians were, were sharing with you, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, there, there are a couple others like, you know, the, um, the study called associations between diet and cancer, ischemic heart disease and all cause mortality in non-Hispanic white California Seventh-day Adventists uh, from 1999. Um, that's probably also one of the most cited ones, but again, similar limiting uh, factors to the Oxford epic. Uh, this one is actually better. Um, and it paints the, the vegan or actually vegetarian diets because only 3% of them were vegan. So, you know, they're, not very many uh, conclusions to be drawn for 100% vegans there, but it does paint vegetarianism in a better um, picture. But even with that one, that is the best one that we have for veganism. Um, even in that one, we do see things like the non-vegetarian Seventh-day Adventists were much less likely to prefer whole grain bread and also consumed alcoholic beverages like 20 times more frequently than um, their vegetarian counterparts. So people... Uh, there, are, there are huge differences between um, <clears throat> healthy behavior um, and, and um, you know, lifestyle factors. Um, and again, it's not to say that it, it's all garbage. Like it's, I'm, I'm sure there are ways to make a vegetarian or vegan diet, you know, uh, 
good for and healthy for a lot of people. But to use that as as proof that the vegan diet is the most optimal, and that you know red meat and and all animal products are bad is just false and misleading, and should almost be illegal to be honest. I agree. <laughs> And you, we talked about this one too. It's similar. This is the Adventist Health Study 2, um, different than the one that you were mentioning. This is 96,000 Seventh-day Adventists. And remember, as you suggest, that if you're looking at an Adventist community, <laughs> these are people yeah, right. who religiously avoid meat. And so anyone that eats meat is basically a heretic and is much more likely to have unhealthy behaviors. Mm -hmm. As they, and they, what they found in this study, they actually mention Epic Oxford in this study. They say that in contrast, the urine pee and prospective investigation into cancer nutrition, Epic Oxford did not show an all cause mortality advantage for British vegetarians. Um, and pooled results have shown reductions in only uh, ischemic heart disease mortality. That's exactly what John and I were talking about before. But if you look at this study, you know, in these Adventists, these Seventh-day Adventists, there was a survival advantage for those who are vegetarian. Okay, interesting. Um, could they possibly have other healthy behaviors that could be accounting for this? Yes. And uh, so one other thing that I've pointed out and I talk about in my book and I've explored previously on TV shows when I got questioned about this is if you look at non- you can also see a survival advantage among non-meat shunning people, <laughs> the California Mormons. So uh. this is similar. So you can see lifestyle and reduced mortality among active California Mormons. And you can see that several healthy characteristics of Mormon lifestyle are associated with substantially reduced death rates and increased life expectancy. But Mormons eat meat. And yeah. so this is exactly what the problem with epidemiology is, is these people have a strong family life, education, abstinence from tobacco and alcohol, and they also live longer than the general population in California, like the Seventh-day Adventists do. But people often forget that they exist, but they don't shun meat. So it's a little bit premature for anyone to suggest that it's because the Adventists are avoiding meat that they're living yeah. longer, right? There's all these other things that can happen. And I talk about this in my book when I sort of debunk the blue zones, which I'm sure was a concept that you were hit with many times. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it's basically, I, I love what you're saying. It's not that these studies are not valuable. It's that we cannot draw premature conclusions from them and jump to conclusions. What we really see in these studies is probably that it's a healthy lifestyle. That's important. Being with people you care about, avoiding tobacco, avoiding alcohol, exercising and being in the sun can give you an improvement in your life. And on top of that, if you eat a non-processed food diet, it's probably good. But whether you include meat or not, you know, who knows? The only thing I'll mention, and I don't know if you've seen this one, John, is that uh, when you actually look at people in Loma Linda, so these same sort of vegetarians in the Seventh-day Adventist study, uh, if you look at those people and you look at their sperm quality, you can see that their sperm quality is very low. Have you heard of this? I've heard of it. I haven't had a chance to, to look over the paper yet, but uh, I've heard something about that. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I can pull it up. It's pretty striking. And so I, I just thought it was, you know, interesting because um, when, you know, with these Adventist studies, people will say, look, they're living longer. And then you look at other characteristics like sperm characteristics in Loma Linda. So this is essentially a similar population to the Adventist Health Study 2, you'll find that the vegetables-based food intake decreased sperm quality. <laughs> in particular, a reduction in sperm quality in male factor patients would be clinically significant, would require review. Furthermore, inadequate sperm hyperactivation in vegans suggested comprised membrane calcium-selected channels. And so it's, you know, I've joked about this and said, I don't know what part of Loma Linda males is actually blue. Um, but uh, I suspect it's their balls, like blue balls. But it's, uh, you know, it's pretty striking that in, a, in a population that's held up as, as healthy, they don't have very good sperm quality. So it's not the whole picture. And I, I just found that so interesting and sort of a, a good um, contrasting story here that, that isn't often told. 
Yeah. And, and now people listening, and especially if you're maybe plant-based or, you know, leaning that uh, towards that direction, um, you're probably saying, okay, well, yeah, I understand the, the limitations of epidemiology. I understand that those uh, RCTs um, from Bernard and Ornish and Esselstyn, they're not, you know, maybe the best. and They don't prove that meat is detrimental and that the vegan diet is the most amazing thing for reversing heart disease. However, looking at the hierarchy of evidence and knowing how many of these health organizations do, you know, say that the vegan diet is healthful and optimal for all stages of life. Surely that must mean that we have way more research that you guys are not showing that suggests that the vegan diet can be healthy. And the interesting thing is, is how this whole, <clears throat> you know, system is taught to doctors, right? You're taught to obey and, and listen to whatever is above you in the authority paradigm, right? Like you're, you're always looking for what's above you and what's at the very top, you know, even above all kinds of meta-analyses and that kind of stuff. It seems like a lot of doctors consider these health organizations to be among the top of the higher cover evidence pyramid. And therefore they, a lot of times base their faith on what they're saying and their recommendations and their position papers without giving much thoughts to uh, where these papers are actually coming from who are actually writing those, um, you know, uh, statements and who are funding these organizations and all kinds of things. And just because, I mean, just think about if you're, if you're, you know, the, the processed food industry, what better place to intervene than the, the very top of, you know, the hierarchy of evidence and, and uh, these health organizations, right? It makes sense that they would infiltrate there. Um, it's pretty common sense to me, but um, a lot of people and doctors that I've spoken to will admit that there is very little science, but that these organizations recommended that, you know, this can be helpful for all stages of life. And therefore I, you know, will believe them. And it's a lot of uh, faith-based thinking or that they, they put a lot of trust in these organizations. And a lot of times they don't look into uh, why they're saying what they're saying, uh, what the studies uh, that are linked to these position papers are actually showing us. And they just, you know, uh, make a, a assumption based on trust and based on the fact that they are above them in the uh, authority kind of scale. And they just, you know, kind of say that it must be fine because they say it is. Good. Yes, it's true. And, you know, having gone through formal medical training, you do not question the hierarchy. Um, <laughs> right. It's not a good thing in medical school or residency to question the hierarchy uh, I frequently found myself tight-lipped and just doing what I'm told. And I yeah. hear from medical students all the time. And one of the hardest questions I get, John, is from medical students and residents saying, what should I do with my career? What should I do? The first thing I say is don't, don't speak up when you're in medical school because it's just not going <laughs> right. to serve you well. Um, you have to get the training. I had a great mentor when I was in medical school who said you have to be, um, you have to be you know, credible before you can be incredible. And so I think you have to get training before you can buck the norm, but it is challenging. I mean, if you can't speak up in medical school and talk about questions you may have, how is the system ever going to change? I don't know, but you bring up a great point that we're not, I was never, there was not one single study that you and I have talked about today that I saw when I was in medical school. Every single one of these are things that I have looked at outside of my formal medical training and talking to people like you and other physicians and other thinkers and doing my own research and writing my book. And these are studies that are not talked about in formal medical education. And, and people are not shown the idea of unhealthy user bias and healthy user bias to the extent that you and I are, are exploring it. So, and I think that it's not, it's not that a plant-based diet cannot create health in humans. It's, it's will vitamin deficiencies develop? Is it optimal for a human? I've repeatedly said that if someone is doing a plant-based diet and thriving, then keep doing that. My yeah. job is not to tell someone else how to live their life or to create their quality of life. Um, it's just to offer the idea that I think that red meat has been incorrectly vilified. And from mm -hmm. my perspective, I think plants exist on a toxicity spectrum. And that if, if people are not thriving, they could be reacting to plant toxins in a way that they're not aware of and eliminating some or all plants can lead to health for humans. And that's my perspective. And so it's an interesting thing. And I love conversations like this where, you know, you're still mostly plant-based, but including animal foods and seeing some improvements. I know that because your son uh, is going to, is that was a big shift for you as well, including animal foods in his diet and what you're thinking of. And you can, you're in a really 
a place to do a lot of good right now. And I hope that this podcast will be part of that effort that you're doing. And I so appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, you can, in a way, you can kind of straddle both realms. I, I, I fear the vegans may chew your leg off if you keep it on their side <laughs> of the fence, as we've talked about. But I mean, yeah. you're still doing a mostly plant-based diet. You understand where these people are coming from. You're very ethical. You're making very ethical decisions. And I think that my greatest hope is that with as eloquent and as sincere as you clearly are, that people who may be stuck in the dogma of plant-based ideology and not thriving may see what you are doing and think, you know, maybe I should include a little bit of meat in my diet and maybe I'll feel better with that. Or maybe my son will feel better with that. Or maybe my mother will feel better if she includes some meat and not to be so stuck in that sort of ethical dogmatic prison around, no, there's no, there's no spiritual, there's no morally good way to eat animals or humans should not be eating animals for uh, health reasons, which really just don't hold up to academic scrutiny in any way, shape or form. I mean, the reason I do this podcast, the reason I do my work, the reason you do your work is so that we might bring some improvement in the quality of life to people out there somewhere. And so I so appreciate what you're doing, man. It's, it's amazing. And I think that this is a great story to share with people. Um, Thank you so much, man. Yeah. And, and likewise, I mean, your, you know, your podcast has, has been amazing. Um, you know, I've been listening to a lot of the latest episodes and I'm really impressed with uh, the guests that you bring on, onto the table and, and the level of open-mindedness uh, of those conversations. So I think that's the most important thing, right? Like not vilifying uh, different people, not, you know, criticizing and hating on people, but getting those conversations going and thinking about things um, from a more of a bird's eye view instead of just focusing on just this ideology, um, you know, path that a lot of people um, in myself in the past uh, included um, so often do. And again, I do love so many vegans like who are still vegan and, and they seem to be thriving. So I'm not here saying that I believe that a vegan diet is going to, you know, be detrimental and people are going to die on it. Potentially people are going to, you know, develop problems just as people are gonna develop problems in other eating patterns. I'm just saying that I wanna talk about this more just so people understand that the science, especially nutrition science, I mean, physics is more, a little bit more black and white, but when, it, when, it, when we're talking about nutrition science, we can't just draw conclusions and, and just use these studies to push our ideology and make false claims. I think that is not ethical. Um, I think that is wrong. And I, and I wanna set the record straight because there's a lot of people uh, after I've stopped being vegan, who just, you know, the, the, the common thread is John, he has no idea about what he's doing. He has no idea about nutrition. He has ne he's only eating junk food. He has no idea and, and should not be listened to for any advice. And, and hopefully with this conversation, you know, we can get some more ideas rolling and, and some of the people that are maybe, you know, uh, either on the carnivore fence or plant-based fence can allow dialogue to come through and not get so triggered and allow conversations to happen uh, more frequently. I think that would be really healing for everyone. Uh, it would be such a, it would be such a, such a success. That would be incredible. And I think that's what we need. It's not, you know, you and I spoke offline about some vegan physicians that I'd had experiences with that were resoundingly negative and some that were yeah. cordial and human. And so I hope that we can do more of the latter, you know, among, among both communities and, and, and find yeah. what works for people in general and, and really help, elucidate the science because there's so much confusing science out there for people. And I just don't want people to be misled. My greatest fear, my greatest sadness is when, um, when people are misled into, you know, false ideologies, false beliefs based on misinterpreted science and they are harmed as a result, which is why I'm interested yeah. in organ meats, why I wrote my book, you know, why it's so great to talk to you about all this stuff so that we can just bring people more, uh, of the truth or what we believe as best we can to be the truth in, in an unbiased way and have conversations. And like we said from the beginning, those vegan studies show us very important points. Um, yeah. Caloric restriction is valuable. Polyunsaturated fatty acid restriction, I believe is valuable. And, and then also as we countered with those studies, it doesn't look like meat is really the factor that's causing the problem for a lot of people. I mean, there were multiple studies that we showed that clearly illustrated that. So I fear that a lot of people go into this plant-based thinking and they throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I just fear that they're going to suffer long-term consequences. If they're thriving, then that's awesome. But um, I just want to keep that conversation open. And, and as you've illustrated, it should not be, it should not be a cardinal sin to say, Hey, I'm going to shift my perspective a little bit. You know, yeah. I've done it. Yeah. 
you've done it, like it's okay. And the dogmatism is what really hurts us when we get so locked in. I mean, you know, the, the backlash that you have had, I think will only make you stronger in the long term. But I, I, I apologize that you've received that. <laughs> you know, it's been such, and there is a little bit of irony there that, that you are a compassionate human, you have compassion tattooed on your wrist. And I'm sure that most of the vegans who are, you know, lashing out at you also have compassion to, tattooed on their wrist or believe that. And yet they're just being very bad examples of human kindness to you who's just speaking his truth. I don't get it. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. And I, you know, I understand, like, I understand how a belief system can, you know, not even, you know, it's not even that the belief system is strong is that this kind of belief system becomes their, their core identity, right? Like they become, um, you know, the, the voice for the vegan movement and they take it upon the, the, themselves as, as this duty to do everything in their power to promote veganism. And I think that's amazing because there's so many things that I relate um, to in terms of the vegan lifestyle. I do believe that compassion is a extremely important human quality and should be extended to, you know, all sorts of uh, life and, and different ways. But Again, it's about not judging and not hating on people for having different perspectives to you. And people do change. Um, I, you know, I'm not uh, someone who's, you know, a completely different person than I was like 10 weeks ago. That It doesn't happen that fast. Like you can, there's some different, like there are so many different ways of thinking. And I think you know, just through the upbringing and, and our educa educational system, uh, you know, the schooling and, and, you know, university and just how the whole world is built. It quite, it kind of points people towards this judgmental and know it all kind of attitude um, and conflicts and these things that I think is so unhelpful, um, especially during these times that the world needs, you know, human collaboration and uh, fairness and kindness more than ever before. I mean, we are at a tipping point in so many different ways, especially you know, with the, the quality of our soil and, and how we're going to be able to sustain ourselves for the rest of our lives and, and, you know, chronic illness taking over at a rate that is so extreme and, and you know, people would never, you know, have imagined this uh, scenario uh, that is going on right now, a hundred years ago. It's insane. And we need to, you know, drop our, you know, weapons and, and try to have these conversations to figure out how to, you know, survive as a human species because, um, you know, love and compassion in our collaboration is going to be the way forward and education, of course, like we need these, uh, you know, the, the free flow of information to everyone and discuss these ideas openly. It's so key. So yeah, I, again, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, man. It's so good. It's so good to have you on. Um, it looks like the video froze right at that moment. John will be back in a second, but when he comes back, I will ask him where we can find him. I believe it's johnvenus.com. He's on Instagram at John Venus. He's on YouTube. So you just froze there for a second, John, but tell yeah. people where they can find you. Um, I'm so glad we actually made it through the majority of this video across the world from each other. I'm surprised. North. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised. The, the feed did pretty good. Where can people find more of your stuff? Yeah. So I'm mostly active on Instagram and YouTube. So if you search my name, John Venus, uh, John without an H and Venus like the planet, you can find me on Instagram and YouTube. And I try to just share my journey, um, health, nutrition, lifestyle tips. Um, and yeah, my, I, I will be waiting for you guys over there. <laughs> Amazing. All right. The last question I always ask people, I, I suspect I may know the answer to this. <laughs> the most radical thing that you have done recently well, I, yeah, I mean, we, we just talked about it for the past two hours, but um, definitely, you know, publicly announcing that I'm no longer vegan um, and changing my lifestyle around and, and having such a big shift is definitely, you know, at least in recent years, one of the most radical things for sure. <laughs> and it's, it's huge, man. It speaks volumes about your character, who you are as a human, um, your bravery and your courage. And I think that you're going to uh, you're going to continue helping a lot of people because of those things. So we're all indebted to you, my friend. And I can't wait to eat a steak with you soon. Maybe we'll get to go hunting. <laughs> For sure. I'll look forward to it, man. All right. Take care, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Two hours and five minutes later. That was an amazing podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found value in John's story, the science, uh, the ethos that we were both trying to present and 
I think that this was one of my favorite ones that I have ever done. So if you know someone in your life who is plant-based and questioning it, if you know someone who is thinking about going plant-based, you might want to recommend this podcast. If you want to know how to talk to people who are plant-based, this is a good podcast to talk about. If you want to know how to understand epidemiology and interventional studies with vegans and vegetarian diets and why they're not telling the whole story, this is a great one. I hope this will be a resource for many of you, and I hope that it will help continue the discussions in a cordial manner uh, that advance all of this information for all of us and ultimately help us all get to a place of better health. This is what it is about. It's what it's about. So I'm doing great. Uh, my newsletter comes out every Sunday. You can subscribe at carnivoremd.com. And I am also sending out updates. I'm doing my controversial thoughts videos. If you are not following me on Instagram or YouTube or Twitter, you are missing out. <laughs> That's where all my good stuff is in addition to the podcast. Thank you for your support. Thank you for checking out the book, thecarnivorecodebook.com. It's already a bestseller in the indie self-published edition. The second edition is going to rock the world August the 4th. Thank you for your support. I appreciate it. Please check out Nutrisense.io. Change someone's life with a CGM, you guys. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, change my dad's life with a CGM. And if you have questions about your own glucose tolerance, it is such a cool investment and worth your money. Um, it is worth it. And then check out whiteoakpastures.com. Please support Belcampo, the mission there. You can use Carnivore MD at both of those farms for a discount. And stay tuned. In the next few weeks, I will be unveiling my super exciting project in nose to tail nutrition. It is really something that I believe in with my heart and soul. Uh, and it is something that I believe will be critical in helping us all improve our nutrition moving forward from a nose to tail perspective. So stay tuned for that. I love you all. Please leave me a review on iTunes. If you appreciate this podcast, please leave my book a review on Amazon. If you've read it, thank you all subscribe to my newsletter, carnivore MD. I love you. Stay radical. I can't wait to talk to you soon.